Guys, yeah, sorry. Actually, I've muted on purpose only because I've uh, I was speaking on a call, so that's the reason I muted it. So don't get panicked. I think now you are able to see and hear me properly. Perfect. Thank you very much for your confirmation. And you know, the, uh, today's topic is going to be on congenital heart diseases. Previously, in the last session, we have discussed on valvular heart disease. Hope that was useful. Now it's time that we discuss some congenital heart disease. I know this is a kind of a topic that's going to be an overlap with pediatrics, but this does have some medicinal aspects in that. So that's the reason I thought I'll take up this topic as well. So we can complete uh, this entire important stuff with regards to congenital heart disease in another two hour session. So we'll try to finish as soon as possible. The first thing I'm going to discuss is a kind of an approach to congenital heart disease, how you're going to do it. So that's very important. So, you know, basically, you're going to divide the congenital heart disease into cyanotic versus asynotic congenital heart disease. So, the first thing that I'm going to see is the fact whether the patient is having any evidence of cyanosis or not. So, in case if the patient uh, doesn't have history or evidence of cyanosis, I'm going to call that as something called as asynotic congenital heart disease. You all know it. If the patient is having uh, any history of cyanosis or evidence of cyanosis or uh, is there any evidence of cyanotic equivalence like squatting spells and so on? So we're going to call it as cyanotic congenital heart disease. Okay, sometimes some textbooks use the short form called as CYCHD. CYCHD stands for cyanotic congenital heart disease. So if it's an asynotic congenital heart disease, what you have to see, you have to see something called as pulmonary blood flow. So whether pulmonary blood flow is increased or pulmonary blood flow is decreased. So there are some asynotic congenital heart diseases where the pulmonary blood flow is increased and there are some asynotic congenital heart diseases where the pulmonary blood flow is decreased. So you might ask me a question. So how clinically I can um, say that the patient is having evidence of increased pulmonary blood flow. So you might be asking a question. How do you clinically say that the patient is having evidence of increased pulmonary blood flow? Anyone wants to answer? So clinically, how can I make sure that the patient is having evidence of increased pulmonary blood flow? Anyone? Yes. So whenever the pulmonary blood flow increases, yeah, there will be pulmonary plethora. Yes, if the pulmonary blood flow is low, you're going to have pulmonary oligemia, but that's the kind of a radiological finding. I'm talking about the clinical presentation of patients having high pulmonary blood flow. Yes, one of the most important signs of increased pulmonary blood flow is tachypnea, increased respiratory rate. Tachypnea is a very, very important sign. You might ask, what is the reason for tachypnea? Simple, because you have more pulmonary blood flow, you have to oxygenate more amount of blood. So that's the reason you have to have tachypnea. And of course, there are some mechanisms in that uh, some receptors are involved, like J receptors and so on. So which basically get activated. And that is the reason why patients develop dyspnea and shortness of breath. And more importantly, this dyspnea is going to cause another problem that's called as cachexia. So, you know, at a baseline, at a basal metabolic situation, around 40% of your energy is spent on respiration. When you're not doing anything, if you're sitting idly, without doing anything, not speaking, not doing anything, 40% of your body's energy is actually spent on your respiration. So imagine this is a kind of a patient who's going to have increased respiratory rate like 24 by 7. So that's going to produce cachexia, very, very important sign. Most of the patients will be having, if the patient is a child, then they'll be having something called as failure to thrive. So they will not have a good weight gain. If it's an adult, they're going to have like weight loss and so on. So cachexia is a very classic sign. So when it comes to a pediatric population, I think uh, Anand sir would have discussed about that. So it's failure to thrive, poor weight gain, poor feeding and so on. So this is a very classic sign of patients who are having increased pulmonary blood flow. And ultimately at one point of time, patient starts developing pulmonary hypertension as well. So this occurs over a period of time, not immediately. So if uh, depending on the amount of uh, pulmonary blood flow and so on, over time, patients are going to develop something called as pulmonary hypertension. Another very, very important point you should know. So cachexia is equal to weight loss. It's not really weight loss, to be honest, cachexia. Cachexia is like very ill-built. So they're not looking good. So they're very sick. So thin-built or not so thin, basically ill-built. So that's what you call as cachexia. And over time, because of increased pulmonary blood flow itself, the reactive vascular changes in the pulmonary circulation can result in pulmonary hypertension. The previous uh, session on valvular heart disease itself, we discussed that whenever there is uh, more amount of blood in the pulmonary vasculature, so that itself will induce some reactive 
vascular changes. There will be smooth muscle proliferation and there will be thickening of the tunica media of these vessels. Yes, and thickening of tunica media of these vessels uh, because of smooth muscle proliferation and the lumen of the vessels will become thinner and over time the resistance will increase and that's what we call as pulmonary hypertension. All right, so now let us move on to the discussion. So what are the conditions that are with increased pulmonary blood flow? Classically, the left to right chance. Classically, we are talking about the left to right chance. You all know. So what are the left to right chance? So classic examples are going to be the AST, the atrial septal defect. Then we have the VST, the ventricular septal defect, the PDA, the patent ductus arteriosus, or we can call it as persistent patent ductus arteriosus. And finally, we have something called as AP window or iatopulmonary window. You might be wondering what is the difference between the PDA and AP window. I'll show you later on. So PDA is a kind of a distal connection. So where the pulmonary artery is going to communicate at the point of the main pulmonary artery or maybe slightly on the left side, the left pulmonary artery. So where it will communicate with the iota, the descending iota typically. On the other hand, uh, Iotopulmonary window is a very proximal communication. So near the origin of the iota and the pulmonary artery, so they'll have a connection. So the flow of blood is going to be more with AP window compared to that of PDA. So depending on the site of connection, you can call it as either a patent ductus arteriosus or you can call it as AP window also. So just the site is different and uh, what is the mechanism of connection is also going to be different. In case if the pulmonary blood flow is low, you can split the problems into stenotic lesions and Regurgitant lesions. Stenotic lesions means the classic valvular heart diseases. So what are the classic valvular heart diseases? Congenital aortic stenosis, pulmonic stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, mitral stenosis. These are rare entities but still can occur. So these are stenotic lesions. And what about regurgitant lesions? Again, the classic valvular heart diseases. We know that. So it can occur congenitally. Not so common, but it can occur. So what are the conditions? Your aortic regurgitation, pulmonic regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, and mitral regurgitation. These are regurgitant lesions. But technically, your uh, pulmonary blood flow is not that high. So what are the conditions that are associated with cyanosis? So if you talk about cyanotic congenital heart disease, once again, I'm going to look at something called as pulmonary blood flow. Once again, I'm going to look at pulmonary blood flow. So whether I'm having an evidence of increased pulmonary blood flow, or I'm going to deal with a decreased pulmonary blood flow. So what I have to know is which ventricle is dominant. So whether it's increased or decreased, it doesn't really matter. I need to know which ventricle is dominant. When I talk about cyanotic congenital heart disease, clinically, I need to know whether it's a RV dominant disease or a LV dominant disease. That's very important. So let me assume the pulmonary blood flow is increased and I'm talking about uh, an RV dominant disease. In which situation you think the right ventricle is going to be dominant? Two conditions, very important. One classic condition that's total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. So what is total anomalous pulmonary venous connection? So here the pulmonary veins are going to be abnormally connected to the right atrium instead of left atrium. I repeat, the pulmonary uh, veins are going to be abnormally connected to the right atrium instead of left atrium. So that's what we call as TAPVC or total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. And we have another interesting situation called as HLHS. Somebody has answered already. That's called as hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome. You can assume that in a patient who's having a hypoplastic left side, left heart, obviously you have to have a RV dominant circulation only. So that's why it's like RV dominant system. And we have conditions with biventricular dominance in the sense like both the ventricles will be dominant. It's not just RV or LV. So both are dominant. The classic example is going to be truncus arteriosus. Remember, whenever I write TA, I mean, I should not write TA. So basically, TA stands for tricuspid atresia also. So let me write completely. So it's truncus arteriosus or simply truncus. Truncus arteriosus or simply truncus. And we have another unique condition called as DTGA. That is dextropost transposition of great arteries. Don't worry about that. We're going to discuss about DTGA in this section. So I'll discuss in detail. And we have another anomaly called as toxic Bing anomaly. If there is time, I'll discuss about this syndrome as well. It's called a toxic Bing anomaly or toxic Bing syndrome. Okay, so what are the conditions that are associated with reduced pulmonary blood flow? Again, I can split into RV dominant disease and LV dominant disease. Can you say a classic RV dominant disease? Anyone? Can you say a classic RV dominant disease? Yes, Wakanda forever is correct. Classic tetralogy of fallot or any fallot's physiology for that matters. Classic RV dominant disease. And it's a basically a condition with reduced pulmonary blood flow because of subpulmonic stenosis. And they're going to have uh, increased pulmonary resistance. And examples of LV dominant disease, who's going to give me the answer? 
So best example of reduced pulmonary blood flow with LV dominant disease. Of course, yes, correct. So Jason is correct. It is a kind of Epstein's anomaly. Epstein's anomaly. Any other example you want to give? So if you want to give another easy example, it's going to be tricuspid atresia. Tricuspid atresia. So somebody is asking, patent for amyloma will be self-limiting but presenting as left direction. No, no. We'll talk about uh, patent for amyloma if there is time. So patent for amyloma is a condition where it's going to open only in some special situations. It's not going to open in all the situations. We'll talk about that. Don't worry about that. So this uh, is a kind of an overview of how to classify a congenital heart disease. Easy one. So if you go through it, you will understand things much, much better. So do you understand this? At least an outline of... Um, so how to approach a congenital heart disease? So into cyanotic, asynotic, then based on pulmonary blood flow, what are the signs of increased pulmonary blood flow? And then uh, you have the shun stenotic regurgitant lesions. And when it's about cyanosis, you need to know about RV dominant and uh, LV dominant disease. So do you understand? Okay, if you understand, let us move on to the next slide. So next slide is all about your atrial septal defect. So AST, so atrial septal defect. So, you know, ASD is an example, perfect example of a kind of a asynotic congenital heart disease, but over time it can become a cyanotic congenital heart disease. We'll talk about the mechanisms of cyanosis over a period of time. Okay, development of CVS, please, but that's going to take a lot of time. So our uh, idea is to discuss only the congenital heart disease. But nevertheless, can you say the mechanisms of cyanotic congenital heart disease? So mechanisms of cyanosis in a congenital heart disease, anyone? So anyone wants to answer? Mechanisms of cyanosis in a congenital, cyanotic congenital heart disease. What are the mechanisms? So we have some three to four physiologies. So the first one is Eisenmenger physiology. Everyone knows that. So these are basically mechanisms. Eisenmenger syndrome is basically not a syndrome. It's basically a physiology. We have something called Eisenmenger physiology. Then we have something called as Fallot's physiology. Fallot's physiology. Then we have something called as common mixing physiology. Common mixing physiology. Then we have something called as transposition physiology. Transposition physiology. So we have four important mechanisms of how you can develop a cyanotic congenital heart disease. So everyone knows what you mean by Eisenmenger physiology. So whenever a left to right shunt becomes a right to left shunt because of pulmonary hypertension, it's called as Eisenmenger physiology. Simple. A left to right shunt becoming a right to left shunt. That's Eisenmenger. So what is Fallot's physiology? So any condition that has a large VSD with pulmonic stenosis, that is going to follow Fallot's physiology. We'll talk more about that later on. Any condition, any condition. So that's going to have a large VSD, irrespective of what is the underlying condition, it really doesn't matter. If you have a large VSD and a pulmonic stenosis, you're going to follow Fallot's physiology. So it's like that. So once you see the diagrams and hemodynamics and tetralogy of Fallot, you will understand why I'm saying this. So we have something called as common mixing physiology. So where there will be a common mixing chamber where blood mixes, the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mixes with each other. The best example for common mixing physiology is going to be truncus arteriosus. Truncus arteriosus. You know what is truncus arteriosus? You're going to have a common arterial trunk. So usually you have to divide the truncus into iota and pulmonary artery. But in these patients, you don't have separate iota and separate pulmonary artery. You're going to have a common arterial trunk. So where the cyanotic and the, sorry, where the deoxidated and the oxygenated blood is going to mix at the truncus. So you're going to have a common mixing chamber over there. So that's basically an example of a common mixing physiology. And everyone knows what is transposition physiology. So where uh, the arteries will be transposed or probably the chambers itself can be transposed. So technically, the best example will be a DTG, that is dextrotransposition of great arteries, where iota is going to originate from the right ventricle and uh, your uh, pulmonary artery is going to basically originate from the left ventricle. So this is basically what we call as detransposition of great arteries. Everyone will be understanding this. So technically, so these are the four major mechanisms. So every single cyanotic congenital heart disease can be put under these four common physiologies. Eisenmenger physiology, Fallot's physiology, common mixing physiology, and transposition physiology. That's it. I hope you can get it now. So now let us move on to the atrial septal defect. So um, where we are going to waste a lot of time is on the embryology part. So to be honest, 
embryology, I don't know how much it's important uh, for NEET exam or I don't know how much it's important for you, even final year board exam. As far as I know, um, nobody has ever asked me like uh, the embryology part in my final year exam or probably in my even in my post-graduation exams. I don't know why I like, but uh, as an undergrad, our mind always goes towards embryology. When we talk about cyanotic congenital heart disease, we tend to waste a lot of time on how the heart develops and how it goes on and so. But the problem is like, it's a kind of a very low yielding information, to be honest. You're not going to get a lot of questions from that. And even as a final year, it's better to understand. I'm not saying it's not uh, re required at all, but it's okay to understand but don't waste a lot of time on it so that's what i would suggest because even in exams even in your board exams or final year exams or whatever exams you go nobody's gonna torture you that much on the embryology part so maybe i i think like even they themselves feel difficult on it to understand so anyways the most important thing is to understand the types and understand the hemodynamics and understand what will be the clinical presentation of the patient so that is what is going to be the key thing and that is something that you should never forget in any congenital heart disease so what are the types of uh, ASD you have, everyone knows. What are the types of ASD? So we have something called as ostium secundum type. Ostium secundum type. All right. Ostium secundum type. This is the most common type, almost like 70% plus types is going to be ostium secundum type only. Then we have something called as ostium primum type. Ostium primum type. Then we have the rare forms. We have the sinus venosus type sinus venosus type and we have the coronary sinus type sinus venosus and coronary sinus type. these are very rare types these are not very common types at all so so what is the important thing about uh, the ostium secundum so what they will expect in exam when you talk about the ostium secundum we are going to have right bundle branch block most commonly and in ECG you are going to have something called right axis deviation so this is something that's been asked so many times in exam because even right from my final year time, so like they didn't ask this question. Ostium secundum means you're going to have RBVB along with right axis deviation. That's very, very important. So what is right axis deviation? We have discussed so much about right axis deviation in our ECG lectures. So where lead one will show negative deflection and lead AVF will show positive deflection, which means in lead one, predominantly you're going to have a deep S wave. Whenever you have a deep S wave in lead one, so that is kind of a negative deflection and lead AVF will be usually positive. So this is typical right axis division. This combination is right axis division and you have to know about it. There's no um, like second thoughts about it. And in exam, this is a very important question as well. Right bundle branch block with right axis division in ostium second and the most common type. 70% of the ASDs will be ostium second and type. And where will be the defect when it comes to ostium second It will be in the lower portion of the septum. I repeat, it's going to be in the lower portion of the intraatrial septum. So a little up in the middle portion of the intraatrial septum, if you have the defect, that's going to be ostium primum type of defects. It's basically ostium primum type of defects. So ostium primum type of defects, you're going to have right bundle branch block, all right, in ACG, but you're going to have something called as left axis deviation. Very, very important. So this is a very crucial point to know for exam. So secondum, always right axis deviation. Primum, left axis deviation very important point extremely important point left axis deviation and ostium primum is a kind of an av cushion defect i repeat ostium primum is basically a kind of av cushion defect so if i ask you so commonly in down syndrome what are you going to see av cushion defect so that you get ostium primum or are you going to get ostium secundum so what you generally tend to get in down syndrome av cushion defects and ostium primum or ostium secundum so maybe in down syndrome you can say that ostium primum type of defects is more common because you're dealing with AV cushion defects over there. And ostium primum is also associated with other problems like cleft mitral valve. I'll repeat, ostium primum type of defects is associated with something called cleft mitral valve because it's an AV cushion defect. Whenever there's an AV cushion problem, it's going to also affect the valves. And the mitral valve, especially the septal leaflet of the mitral valve is basically coming from the AV cushion. So that's the reason why in primum commonly you tend to have cleft mitral valve. And because of that, mitral regurgitation is quite common. And that is also one reason why commonly you're going to have left axis deviation in these patients. You can understand that. So what about sinus venosus type? Sinus venosus type is commonly associated with either a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection or a total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. It's a rare entity, 
but I'm writing APV. So what do you mean by APV? Most of the times, sinus venosus type of ASD will be associated with anomalous pulmonary venous connection. So Sartak is asking how ostium primum can be associated with the AV cushion defects. No, no, no. So the AV cushions are the ones that are associated with the formation of the septum secundum. So if you have AV cushion problem, you will not develop septum secundum. So if you don't develop septum secundum, the defect is called as ostium primum. I, I don't know how much to explain about that, but I think you can get that. So you won't have the septum secundum at all in ostium primum defects. And uh, if you don't have septum, septum secundum, that the any middle portion of the septum is still going to be open. And that is what we call as ostium primum defects. And basically that's an AV cushion defect. So you don't get it. So nevertheless, sinus venosus type. So in sinus venosus type, one of the most important thing is the fact that you're going to have anomalous pulmonary venous connection. I repeat, either it can be a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection or a total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. That's it. And coronary sinus defects are basically extremely rare. You don't, you don't see that commonly. Coronary sinus defects are very, very rare. Very, very rare. So it will be with multiple other congenital anomalies. We're not going to talk about that right now. So what are the basic hemodynamics? The basic hemodynamics is very, very simple. So you're going to have increased RA-RV blood flow. Increased RA-RV flow. This is going to increase the pulmonary blood flow. And this is the most important part of the hemodynamics. Because the blood is going to get shunted from left atrium to right atrium, you're going to have more RA blood flow. And then you're going to have more subsequent RV blood flow. And that is going to subsequently increase pulmonary blood flow. If you have a look at this hemodynamic diagram, you can understand things better. Here is your atrial septal defect in the intraatrial septum. And here's the pictorial representation. You're having an ASD over here. So that is going to basically kind of increase the blood flow to the right atrium from the left atrium. And then it's going to increase the right ventricular blood flow. And then you're going to have increased pulmonary blood flow. So this is simple pathophysiology. So here the right ventricle is volume overloaded or pressure overloaded. People can answer. Like last time we answered, isn't it? So once you have understood the valvular heart disease section, this must be a cakewalk. So now you can yourself say the right ventricle is volume overload or pressure overload. Of course, there will be RV dilatation over a period of time. There will be right atrial enlargement also, but patients are going to have RV dilatation. RV dilatation. That is the reason why um, you have to understand the basics. So it's a RV volume overloaded state. So you're going to have RV dilatation. And whenever the ventricles are volume overloaded, you're going to get third heart sound or fourth heart sound. Again, this is a basic concept that we have discussed in the previous section itself. Volume overloaded, third heart sound or fourth heart sound. Great. So I think many of you guys have like attended the session, I mean, the previous session very nicely. So yeah, of course, like RVS3 is very, very common in patients with uh, large atrial septal defects because of RV dilatation and RV volume overload. And that's what is exactly occurring. So over a period of time, what occurs? So your pulmonary blood flow, over a period of time, it will uh, result in pulmonary hypertension. It will result in pulmonary hypertension. So because of pulmonary hypertension, slowly, slowly what happens is the pulmonary blood flow keeps dropping. And at one point of time, the shunt reverses. This shunt reversal is what we call as Eisenmenger syndrome. And apart from that, you can hear a murmur in ASD. What is that murmur? Where is that murmur? Where will you hear the murmur? What is the mechanism of that murmur? So you can hear a murmur in ASD. It's basically an ejection systolic murmur. Yes, basically an ejection systolic murmur. And that will be heard in the right upper sternal border. That will be in the right, sorry, left upper sternal border in the pulmonic area, left upper sternal border in the pulmonic area. And this is basically because of increased pulmonary blood flow. Remember, this is a flow murmur. This is not an organic murmur. This is a flow murmur. Very, very important point. So just because of increased pulmonary blood flow, you are hearing an ESM in the pulmonary area. So technically, this is a flow murmur. Very important point. And you never gonna hear shunt murmur in ASD. No shunt murmur in ASD. So why? Because the gradient between left atrium and the right atrium is very, very negligible. You're going to have very, very less gradient, which means the pressure difference between L and RA is hardly going to be like one or two millimeters of mercury. And that is the one that's driving the blood. 
So that's the main reason why you are not going to hear any shunt mama. One exception I told you though in the previous session. So what is that exception? If you have attended the previous session, you should be able to answer this one exception. The only place where you hear the shunt murmur in ASD. Already people have answered it. Yes, it is Lutumbacker syndrome. Whenever the patient is having an ASD with acquired mitral stenosis. Yes, that's correct. So that's called as Lutumbacker syndrome. That is the place where you're going to have shunt murmur. After, after Eisenmenger syndrome, also shunt murmur will be present? No. Once you develop Eisenmenger syndrome. See, I told you already. Uh, this is actually a flow murmur because of high pulmonary blood flow. Once Eisenmenger happens, once pulmonary hypertension comes, this pulmonary uh, blood flow will come down. So this pulmonary blood flow will come down once pulmonary hypertension comes. And uh, over time, what happens is the flow keeps reducing. So the murmur also keeps disappearing. See, in clinical practice, there is a common rule. I'll tell you what is that rule. So whenever the murmur keeps coming down, it is actually quite ominous. Because the patient is developing more and more pulmonary hypertension and that is actually going towards Eisenmenger syndrome. So once the patient develops Eisenmenger syndrome, you will not hear any murmur. Everything will be done. So there will be no murmur. Disappearance of murmur is actually going to mark the onset of Eisenmenger syndrome. That's very, very important. Okay. Nevertheless, we talked about the flow murmur, right? And uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, can you tell that is there higher flow from the RA to RV as the lower flow from RA, RA to RV? Flow across RA to RV across tricuspid valve is more or high, more or low. So you're having higher flow, more flow, right, from RA to RV. So sometimes you can also hear a flow mid-diastolic murmur, flow mid-diastolic murmur. This is purely a flow murmur. This is not an organic murmur because of tricuspid stenosis. It's just a flow MDM that you will be able to hear sometimes in the uh, tricuspid area that is in the left lower sternal border possible that is just because of higher flow across the tricuspid valve and uh, if there is more blood flow across the tricuspid valve that valve will open widely or valve will open for a very short distance if there is tremendous flow across the tricuspid valve so valve is going to open widely so if it's going to close from a wider position you are going to result in a loud s1 or a soft s1 if it's going to close from a wider position it's going to result in loud s1 or soft s1 Yes, of course. So sometimes you will be able to hear even loud S1 in patients with atrial septal defect. This is not the only place where you hear loud S1 because of this. Maybe in other conditions also you'll be able to hear loud S1 whenever the valve opens widely because of higher flows. Okay, all right. So I told you most important things, the right ventricular third heart sound, you're going to have RV dilatation, you're going to have ESM in the left upper sternal border in the pulmonary area, that's a flow murmur, no shunt murmur in AST, loud S1 and a flow MDM across the tricuspid valve. That is in the left lower sternal border. So these are classic manifestations of ASD. And uh, do you think like ASD shunt can be easily reversed physiologically? Do you think ASD shunt can be reversed physiologically or it can be only reversed when Eisenmenger syndrome develops? Is this class for post interns appearing next? Of course, yes. This class is for post interns also who are appearing for next. So do you think uh, the shunt of ASD can be reversed easily or it can be reversed only with Eisenmenger syndrome? So shunt of ASD can be reversed only with Eisenmenger or it can be reversed easily? So people are saying it can be reversed easily. So if it can be reversed easily, so what is the maneuver that reverses the shunt easily? Tell me what is the maneuver that's going to reverse the shunt easily. Wow, correct. That's Valsalva. Valsalva is a maneuver that can basically reverse the shunt pretty much easily because when you're going to increase the intrathoracic pressure, easily the shunt will, uh, like what to say to, it's going to reverse from right atrium to left atrium. So you can actually reverse the shunt. So minute, minute, small, small clots are common in venous circulation or arterial circulation where the blood is going to be in stasis in the veins or in the arteries. In arteries, it's going flowing actively or in the veins, it's uh, flowing actively. In the veins, yes. So because the stasis of blood is common in the veins, so small, small clot formation is quite common in the veins. So these small, small clots generally will get filtered in the pulmonary circulation. Don't think that you're going to end up with pulmonary embolism all the time. Even in patients uh, uh, who are normal also, sometimes small, small clots can be formed that can be filtered easily in the pulmonary circulation. But if a patient 
is doing valsalva valsalva in the sense when he is training in the bathroom he is constipated and is training in the bathroom or he is exercising lifting some heavy weights so these are common examples of where you undergo valsalva right so during those times the shunt can be reversed right shunt can be reversed so tell me you said asd shunt can be easily reversed so asd is going to increase the risk of paradoxical embolism or vsd is going to be associated with paradoxical embolism you tell me asd is going to increase the risk of paradoxical embolism or vsd is going to increase the risk of paradoxical embolism because in vsd just with valsalva you will not be able to reverse the shunt because the pressure gradient is too high lv has far higher pressures you can't reverse the shunt that easily but in asd the pressure difference between la and ra is so less so you can easily reverse the shunt so asd is a situation where you are going to have higher risk of paradoxical embolism somebody has been asked about asking about something called as pfo that is patent foramen ovale so what is patent foramen ovale there is no obvious like shunt there is no obvious hole in the septum but there is a area or we can call it as a defect which can be opened at times like during valsalva so basically there is no obvious opening in patent foramen ovale but during some times you will be able to open that patent foramen ovale okay as it stretches and it opens you can open that patent foramen ovale especially when the person undergoes valsalva so if you look at a patient who's having a patent foramen ovale so they are not going to have any asd so they won't have any problem uh like ra rv dilatation or increased pulmonary blood flow there's no increased pulmonary blood flow here there is no increased ra rv flow there is no increased pulmonary blood flow here but what is the problem whenever they like violently cough here somebody is asking is is even coughing is an example of valsalva if they are violently coughing or if the patient is undergoing some uh, weight lifting or if the patient is training in the bathroom or training due to some other reason this pfo can open that time if there is some clot in the venous circulation small clot it's going to go from right atrium to the left atrium so do you think pfo increases the risk of pulmonary embolism or it doesn't increase the risk of pulmonary embolism so pfo doesn't cause any other problem up except one issue that you can face that is patent for amenol i mean paradoxical embolism that's it. do you get it what i'm trying to say yes or no are you understanding what i'm trying to say so pfo doesn't have any problems of ast except there is going to be a small risk of paradoxical embolism which can result in stroke that's the problem with pfo because in the beginning itself somebody has been asking about patent for amenovel so that's why i told about that okay so now things are done so i think you have understood the hemodynamics properly now let us uh, talk about the pulse you don't have uh, any much problem in the pulse as such when it comes to asd so you're going to have a relatively normal pulse what about jvp so what about jvp jugular venous pressure jugular venous pressure uh, depends so you can have normal jvp or even increased jvp if at all i ask you what are the cause of increased jvp in a patient with asd what are you going to answer so two things one you are going to answer once the patient develops pulmonary hypertension you are going to have uh, increased jvp but when a patient is having pulmonary hypertension or probably eisenmenger syndrome you are going to have a large a wave large a wave and in case if the patient is not having pulmonary hypertension jvp can still be elevated but here you are going to have a large v wave so you know in jvp what is the v wave v wave is basically the venous filling of the atrium so here the atrium is getting filled extra the right atrium is getting filled extra by the left atrium so normally the right atrium should be filled by your svc and ivc and that is what is contributing to the v wave but here the right atrium is getting filled extra by the left atrium also apart from svc and ivc that's why you're going to have large v wave in some patients and somebody is asking why it can be normal because sometimes the shunt can be so small that uh, the increase in the rv i mean increase in the ra blood flow can be like very very negligible and very minute so that's probably the reason why like you don't see that increased jvp in almost all the patients so some patients can have a normal jvp also because you don't have that much of like uh, like too much of blood flow to the right atrium so why large v wave very simple so i told you the explanation already so you are having the jvp like this so let me draw like this okay so this is the jvp so you are having a c x v and y descent so i'm asking what is the reason for the v wave the reason for the v wave is venous filling so venous filling the svc and ivc 
is going to fill the right atrium. SVC and IVC is going to fill the right atrium and that is the main reason for the V-wave. But you know, in ASD, in some patients, the V-wave can be large. Whenever the V-wave is taller than the A-wave itself, we can call it as large V-wave. So that's why I've drawn a large V-wave over here. The reason for why you are having a large V-wave is very simple. You're not only having RA filling by SVC and IVC, but here the RA is filled by left atrium as well because the blood is coming from left atrium additionally. So that's the reason why you're having a large wave. Can you understand why you can have a large wave? Yes or no? So I've given a pictorial representation also. It's not only filled by SVC and IVC, it's filled by left atrium also. Okay. What about the epical impulse? Easily understandable. So, I mean, um, here the epical impulse most of the times will be normal unless and until the patient is having like huge dilated right atrium. But in a classic situation, what's going to happen is you're going to have a RV apex. You can have a right ventricular apex. You don't even have an LV apex. Sometimes you can have a right ventricular apex because of dilatation of the right ventricle. Massive RV dilatation. And how will you say it's an RV apex? See, LV apex is something that you can localize at one point, isn't it? But RV apex, you can't localize. Yes, you're going to have diffuse apex. That's a very, very important point. That too, in a volume ordered right ventricle, the apex will be diffuse. And that is why if you look at your textbooks, what they would have given is, in an ASD, they would have mentioned that the precordium will be very active and you're going to have diffuse pulsations. Beautiful point. They will say that the precordium is going to have a diffuse pulsations. You can see like hyperdynamic precordium, diffuse pulsations. See, so yeah, and one more thing I want to ask, because you, you have attended the previous session on valar heart disease, let me ask this question. So if you're going to have volume overload, you're going to have hyperdynamic like ventricle or you're going to have a pressure overload ventricle. It will be hyperdynamic or heaving. If you have volume overload, it's hyperdynamic or heaving. Yeah, whenever there is volume overload, we discussed already, you're going to have a hyperdynamic left front. I mean, hyperdynamic ventricle, right? So here, RV will be hyperdynamic. That's why they would have mentioned something called as hyperdynamic precording because RV is a, a going to cause kind of a diffuse pulsation. You're going to have a hyperdynamic precording. So these are all classic words in exam that you have to know. So diffuse pulsations, hyperdynamic precording, RV apex predominantly. So classic. So this is indicating RV dilatation and typically an ASD atrial septal defect. So what about S1 and S2? You yourself can answer. First heart sound is going to be loud. So you're going to have loud first start sound. That is basically because of increased flow across the tricuspid valve, opening it widely. Very classic. And uh, you are going to have, yes, the characteristic wide fixed split. So that's characteristic. So wide fixed split. So normally how you're going to denote the split, I can denote like A2 and P2. In patients with atrial septal defect, you're going to have A2 and P2 like this. So why? That is because of increased pulmonary blood flow causing delayed P2. So you're going to have a late P2 or a delayed P2. And that is typically because of increased pulmonary blood flow. And that is the one that is actually widening the split. So and of course, the split will be fixed also. The main reason why the split will be fixed is, see, there are a lot of explanations for that. I don't want to complicate stuff. But simple explanation is, whenever there is any pressure change between LA and RA, it can easily like shunt among itself. So if there is an increased pressure in the right atrium, it can shunt towards the RA, left atrium. If there's increased pressure on the left atrium side, it can shunt towards the right atrium. So because they can balance each other out in most situations, and that's the reason why you're going to have a fixed split in your ASD. You don't have a fixed split in like VSD or PDA. That is because like, so the pressure difference cannot be shunted that easily because the pressure difference between chambers is like very high over there. But in ASD, you don't have that much of pressure difference between RA and LA. So that's one probable reason. There are a lot of explanations for that. I don't want to complicate stuff. That's why I said in the beginning itself. So that's why I'm saying that uh, you don't have the difference in the flow of blood across the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. So you're going to have a kind of a fixed split. How will you say that the patient is having a fixed split? So if the split doesn't change with Valsalva, no change with Valsalva, very, very important point. If the split doesn't change with Valsalva, that is what is going to be the definition of a fixed split. So, you know, clinically, how will you say it's a, a white split or a narrow split? So, you're going to see the split in inspiration and expiration. Let me write it here. 
So you're going to see the split in inspiration as well as expiration. If you're able to hear the split in inspiration, but you're not able to hear in expiration, it's basically kind of normal split. If you are not able to hear in both inspiration and expression, it's a kind of a narrow split. If you are able to hear in both inspiration and expression, it's a kind of a wide split. If you are able to hear in expression, but not in inspiration, this will be basically called as paradoxical split, or we can call it as reversed splitting or paradoxical splitting. So this is actually like how we clinically say whether pain is having a narrow split or a wide split or a, a paradoxical split. So when you call it as a fixed split, when the split like duration does not change with Valsalva, when the split duration, whatever may be the split duration that you are hearing, if it does not change with Valsalva, if it does not change with Valsalva, we are going to call it as fixed splitting. The two most classic causes of fixed splitting will be your ASD and probably right ventricular failure. In patients with right ventricular failure also, because RV cannot change the blood uh, cardiac output despite increased or decreased failure, the cardiac output will be fixed in a failing ventricle. Even in right ventricular failure, you're going to have a fixed split. Two most, there are plenty of causes, don't confuse. So just two causes, very important for exams. One is atrial septal defect and second is going to be your right ventricular failure where the patients will not be able to, where the right ventricle will not be able to handle the changes in the volume. So whatever may be the preload, it's going to have a fixed cardiac output. It cannot increase or decrease the cardiac output based on the preload. So that's the reason why in RVF also you can have a fixed split. So that's it. So Mahima is asking, repeat this table, very simple. So normally the split should be heard in inspiration only. You're not going to hear in expiration. That's normal. If you don't hear in both inspiration and expression, that is narrow split. If you're going to hear in both inspiration and expression, that is wide split. If you don't hear in inspiration, but on the other hand, paradoxically, if you hear in expression, that's called as a paradoxical split or otherwise called as a reverse splitting. So what is the extra sound that you are able to hear in some patients? Honestly speaking, you will be able to hear opening snap, but answer this only when it is asked. So technically you can hear opening snap. That is because the tricuspid valve is going to open widely. Sometimes if you have a very high right atrial pressure, the tricuspid valve can open with a bang, with a force, and that can go and hit on the sides resulting in an opening snap. So basically this opening snap is a tricuspid opening snap or a mitral opening snap. Please answer faster. We'll finish it faster today. So is it a tricuspid opening snap or a mitral opening snap? Of course, you can hear an opening snap, theoretically speaking. So it's going to be a tricuspid opening snap, not a mitral opening snap. And... Uh, Another extra sound that you'll be able to hear very commonly is right ventricular third heart sound. Right ventricular third heart sound. Another very, very important point, RVS3. That is because of RV volume overload. We have discussed that already. And another important point is, apart from the white fixed split of the second heart sound, sometimes you can even hear the loud P2 or we can call it as palpable P2. When you're going to have loud P2 or palpable P2, whenever the patient starts developing pulmonary hypertension. When a patient starts developing pulmonary hypertension, you're going to have loud P2 or we can call it as uh, palpable P2, even that could be the examiner's clue. So what are going to be the murmurs that you're going to hear? So as I said, the ejection systolic murmur, which is basically a flow murmur, is very, very common in the left upper sternal border, that is in the pulmonic area. Technically, you don't hear any shunt murmur, we know that. So remember, one important point about this murmur is whenever the murmur decreases, it is basically an ominous sign, which means patient is going to go towards a Eisenmenger physiology. So decline in the intensity of the murmur is always a red flag. It's an ominous sign where the pulmonary hypertension becomes severe. So that's what it indicates. And sometimes, theoretically speaking, you will be able to hear a mid-diastolic murmur. That's a flow MDM in the left lower sternal border in the tricuspid area because of excessive flow across the tricuspid valve. So these are going to be the most important clinical findings in a patient with atrial septal defect. Do you get it? Yes or no? Are you understanding? This is basically not complex, but very important. Yes, right? So yes, all the clinical findings summarized in this table. Okay, what are the indications for repair? See, previously there, has, there was supposed to be so much of indications, but right now things have become like uh, very simple and straightforward. The only absolute indication for repair in a setting of ASD is RA-RV dilatation. That's it. RA-RV dilatation regardless of symptoms. If RA-RV is dilated regardless of symptoms, regardless of symptoms, whether pain is symptomatic or not, it doesn't matter. If RARV is dilated, you're going to repair it.
that's it. Eisenmenger is basically a contraindication for repair of any left to right chance. If the patient is having Eisenmenger syndrome, you're not going to repair it. Please take it for granted. So the repair is contraind. You cannot close the shunt. The patient will die if you close the shunt. Not possible. So RIRB dilatation, irrespective of symptoms. So whether you close percutaneously or whether you're going to close uh, uh, by open surgical procedure. So that depends on what is the type of defect. So if it's an uncomplicated osteum secondum defect, then you can close percutaneously. There are some button closure devices. You can close percutaneously. No need to cut open the chest. But if it's a complicated osteum secondum or any other type of defects like primum sinus venous or coronary sinus, it's better to do a surgical closure. Uh, usually, surgeons will not opt for a percutaneous closure if it's a primum or sinus venous or coronary sinus defect. Again, in complicated osteum secondum defects, usually surgical closure is better. But in uncomplicated cases, which is going to be the most common scenario in your hospital, you can opt for a percutaneous closure without any major surgery. So that's it about atrial septal defect. Now let us move on to ventricular septal defects, that is VST. It's very simple. Again, people think anatomy is very, very important, but uh, to an extent it's fine, but it's not uh, uh, like required too much. Surgery names, I'll try to like summarize later on if there is time, but we should not uh, miss out on the most important aspects. So that's why first let us finish off the most important aspects, then uh, we'll try to discuss what is required. And most of the times in ASD and VSD, uh, you don't have any special surgery types basically in ASD and VSD. So these are just techniques and no special names have been given in most cases. So what are the types of VST? So everyone knows, right? So what are the types of VST? Who's going to answer? So we have something called as Perimembranous or membranous type of VST. Perimembranous or membranous type of VST, which is basically the most common form. 60 to 70 percent, almost two-thirds of the cases will be membranous type of VST only, the most common form. Yes, you do have muscular VST. All right. We have something called as muscular VST. And number three, you're going to have something called as supracrystal VST. Supracrystal VST, which is also called as outlet VST supracrystal outlet VST and we have something called as uh, AV canal type AV canal type or it is called as inlet type VST AV canal type or inlet type VST we have four types of VST so in that the most common is perimembranous type of VST so among this which has the highest chance of spontaneous closure which of the following has the highest chance of spontaneous closure it's muscular Muscular VSTs are the ones that have the highest chance of spontaneous closure. Other types of VSD have literally no chance of spontaneous closure. Membranous and all will not close at all. Outlet, inlet, absolutely no chance. But unfortunately, the most common type is membranous. 60 to 70 percent of the times, it will be membranous type of VST only. And one important thing about the supracrystal or outlet VST is it's frequently associated with aortic regurgitation. It will be associated with Aortic regurgitation. This is a very commonly asked question. In outlet VSTs, AR is very commonly associated. That is because if you're going to have a VST at this point, so the blood is going to go from LV to RV and then into the pulmonary circulation. So that time, so if you're having a VST at the outlet portion, at the outlet portion, so this movement of blood across the shunt can result in high velocity. We discussed already in the previous uh, like valvular heart disease chapter where uh, we, I told that whenever there is excessive blood flow, like whenever there is faster blood flow across a narrowed orifice, by Bernoulli's principle, you're going to reduce the pressure. So if you're going to reduce the pressure in this region, okay, because of like velocity, increased velocity of blood flow, so you're going to really suck this aortic valve towards the septum. So this sucking of the aortic valve towards the septum during systole can result in damage to the aortic valve. Okay, and that can result in aortic regurgitation over a period of time. Can you understand what is the mechanism of AR in an outlet VST? So you're going to have VST near the outlet. So the Bernoulli effect is going to cause low pressure in that area. And that's going to literally suck the aortic valve towards the uh, VSD. And that's going to damage the aortic valve over a period of time. And that is going to result in aortic regurgitation. Are you understanding? Yes or no? Yes, right? Fine. So what is the important thing about AV canal or inlet VST? So when you talk about AV canal or inlet VST, as the name implies, 
it's a av cushion defect so av cushion defect so in down syndrome is it common or uncommon so av canal defects in down syndrome is common or uncommon common so you're going to be commonly as a down syndrome point number 1 point number 2 uh, is the fact that patients will be having which type of asd now you're going to say with av canal type of vsd you're going to have ostium primum asds or ostium secundum asds Fantastic. So many people are answering correctly. So you're going to have ostium primum type of ASD. Yes, that's correct. Where you're going to have left axis deviation. And you can also have an associated cleft mitral valve. Yes. So these are the common things that are associated with AV canal type of VSTs. Otherwise called as inlet type of VSTs. So what's going to be the hemodynamic data? So what about the pulse? Um, I'll tell you two things, but don't ask me too much of questions in that. Pulse will be hyperkinetic. Pulse will be hyperkinetic like MR, but you're going to have normal volume pulse, normal volume. Classically, MR and VST will be having normal volume pulse only. So you can ask me why. So for that, you need to understand the hemodynamics first. So, I mean, it's quite interesting. Of course, like uh, whenever there is uh, uh, a VSD, you're going to have increased blood flowing across the pulmonary area. So you're going to have increased pulmonary blood flow. And where this pulmonary blood is going to come? So where this pulmonary blood is going to come, it's going to come back to the left atrium and the left ventricle. So it's going to come back to the left atrium and the left ventricle. So what you're going to essentially have is increased LA-LV flow. You're going to have increased LA as well as increased LV blood flow. So technically, the blood is using right ventricle as a conduit. So you might not understand even now. You might think like why RV is not dilating then. RV really won't dilate in a case of VST. That is because when the event is occurring, when the blood is moving from LV to RV, that is during systole, it's not just the LV that is in systole. Even the RV is in systole at that point of time. Even the right ventricle is in systole at that point of time. So because right ventricle is also contracting at the same time when the blood is moving into the right ventricle, so right ventricle will not basically dilate because it's in systole. So the RV is going to just allow the blood to pass into the pulmonary circulation. So that's why in a patient with VST, you don't really have RV volume overload. Rather, the blood is going to come via the pulmonary circulation back into the LA and then into the LV. So you're going to have LA and LV volume overload. So you're going to have increased flow across the tricuspid mitral valve here. And you're going to have increased LV blood, I mean, uh, amount of blood in the LV is also going to increase. So what you're going to have in LV, you're going to have LV volume overload or pressure overload. LV volume overload or LV pressure overload here? Easy, isn't it? So you're going to have LV volume overload. Because of that, there will be LV dilatation. LV dilatation. You don't have RV dilatation. Rather, you're going to have LV dilatation. And this is going to produce left ventricular third heart sound. And you're going to have a hyperdynamic apex. But here, the apex is LV, not RV. You're going to have a hyperdynamic apex. The L apex will be basically made of LV, not RV, like in AST. They're going to have a left ventricular third heart sound because of volume overload of the left ventricle. And in some cases, as I described already, you will be able to hear a flow murmur that is flow mid-diastolic murmur across the mitral valve also. Even that is possible because of more blood flow across the mitral valve. And over time, patients can develop LA dilatation also and patients can develop pulmonary edema, pulmonary congestion. And over time, slowly, 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 this excessive pulmonary blood flow will result in reactive pulmonary vascular changes. And that can trigger the development of pulmonary hypertension. And this pulmonary hypertension slowly, slowly, slowly will start obliterating the shunt and slowly the murmur will disappear. And ESM at pulmonary area, absolutely possible. Possible. I'm not saying always it will be seen. But yes, you can uh, hear a kind of a ESM, which is basically again a flow murmur at left upper sternal border that is pulmonic area, which is still possible, which is possible. I'm not saying that's the most important thing, but it's possible. In ASD, that's important because that's the only murmur that you hear in ASD. That's why there it became important. But here it's not like that. Here this is not that much relevant because you're going to hear an obvious shunt murmur here because the pressure gradient between LV and RV is very, very high. So of course, you're going to hear a shunt murmur. There is no doubt about that. You're going to hear a shunt murmur. And typically, the shunt murmur is going to be a pan-systolic murmur. It's going to be a pan-systolic murmur because throughout the systole, the blood is going to move from LV to RV because RV throughout, throughout the systole is going to have a lower pressure compared to LV. 
So you're going to have a pansystolic murmur. So remember, once the murmur comes down, if the murmur starts disappearing or it reduces in intensity, that is where you have to be worried of because the patient is actually going towards Eisenmenger syndrome or Eisenmenger physiology. And uh, one more important thing to note is the fact that uh, LV is like dilated, LV is receiving more blood. So what will be the force of contraction of LV? It will be like more or it's less. Force of contraction is more or less. Force of contraction is more because it receives more volume. So because the force of contraction is more, it's going to produce a brisk contraction, a brisk, sudden contraction, a brisk contraction. So that will result in a brisk uptake of the pulse. The pulse will have a very brisk uptake. That's what we call as hyperkinetic pulse. Hyperkinetic pulse. Because of like forcible LV contraction. But you know that the LV here has two outlets. LV here has two outlets. One into the iota and second into the right ventricle. So this hyperdynamicity, like what we have studied in MR, is required to maintain at least a normal flow across the iota. Are you understanding or not? If you have understood that MR concept, you should be able to understand here also. So the hyperdynamicity of LV is important to maintain at least a normal aortic blood flow. Once the hyperdynamicity comes down, LV will fail, which means relatively it will fail, even though like uh, it can contract still better than other ventricles, but it's like hyperdynamicity is required at least to maintain a normal blood flow because a part of the blood is always moving towards the right ventricle. So that's why he said you're going to have only a normal volume pulse. Are you understanding or not? So that hyperdynamicity will be there. You're going to have a hyperkinetic pulse, but that brisk contraction will be followed by a normal volume pulse only. The pulse volume will not increase. That is because a part of the blood is moving into the iota, all, I mean, into the right ventricle all the time. So what about the JVP? Jugular venous pressure It's going to be relatively normal. It will not be elevated because it's basically a left-sided problem. So if it's increased, you have to strongly think about pulmonary hypertension. And you know, in pulmonary hypertension, you're going to have a large A wave. You should never forget that. In pulmonary hypertension, you're going to have a large A wave. And what about the epical impulse? Epical impulse will be like hyperdynamic in nature and it will be left ventricle only. It will be of left ventricle and you're going to have a hypodynamic epical impulse and uh, it will be displaced because of LV volume overload. You're going to have a displaced epical impulse. Displaced in the sense we are talking about down and out epical impulse. If you have understood the previous lecture, this should be a cakewalk for you. So it will be a down and out displaced epical impulse because it's dilated. So what about S1 and S2? So because of increased flow, just apply the concept. We have discussed that already. Because of increased flow across the mitral valve, the valve will open widely. If the valve opens widely, you're going to have loudest one or softest one. You're going to have loudest one or softest one. So of course, you're going to have loudest one. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And what about the S2? S2 split is very, very important. So what will be the split? So S2 will be having a narrow split. So narrow split basically indicates that the VSD is severe. So that is because you know A2, P2, but here A2 will occur a uh, little early. No, no, uh, split will be wide. Sorry, I just got carried away with the person who has answered it. Split will be wide or narrow? Split will be wide. It will not be narrow. So why your split is going to be wide? That is because you're going to have A2 and P2. So you're going to have an early A2 because less blood only flows into iota. Less blood only flows into iota. And there is increased pulmonary blood flow. So you're going to have a late P2 also. That is because increased pulmonary blood flow and early A2 because reduced iotic blood flow. Iotic blood flow. The more wider the split is, it indicates that the pulmonary blood flow is more. So basically, you're going to have a wide split. So once the split becomes narrow, if the P2 becomes loud and once the split becomes narrow, if it becomes a narrow split, basically you can suspect pulmonary hypertension. This is where you have to think about severe pulmonary hypertension. Initially, the white split is going to tell the severity of the VST, but once the pulmonary hypertension develops, pains are going to develop loud P2 and a kind of a narrow split. Very important point. What about the extra sounds? Of course, left ventricular third heart sound is common. And as expected, you can also note the opening snap. We have discussed that already. So opening snap is possible, but this is going to be a mitral opening snap. Possible, not always theoretically possible. It's a mitral opening snap or aortic, op I mean, tricuspid opening snap. 
you're you're going to answer based on the concepts that we have discussed. Mitral or uh, tricuspid opening snap? Yes, of course, this will be a mitral opening snap. That is because of excessive blood flow across the mitral valve. So what about the murmurs? Basically, like three murmurs you can hear, but the most important murmur is the shunt murmur. That's the pan-systolic murmur that you're going to hear in the left to lower sternal border. So this is basically the shunt murmur. Shunt murmur. If I say one sentence, the intensity of the murmur is proportional to the severity of the defect. True statement or false statement? Intensity of the murmur is proportional to the severity of the defect. True or false statement? It's absolutely false statement. Intensity of any sound is not going to be... No, no, it's not inversely. It's, it's not correlated inversely. It's not correlated directly also. You cannot say any correlation with the intensity of any heart sound with the severity of the defect. So that is where somebody is asked about what is Rogers defect. A very small muscular VST can produce like huge murmurs. It's a very high intensity murmur. That's what you called as malady D. Roger. That's called as malady D. Roger or Rogers defect. So what do you mean by that? A very small VST, a very small muscular VST can produce a very high intensity murmur. So that's what we called as Rogers murmur, Rogers defect or malady D. Roger. So you cannot correlate the intensity of any sound or any murmur with that of the severity of the defect. That's a gold standard point. So this is the most important murmur. And you know, as the murmur keeps coming down, it indicates that uh, you are developing more and more pulmonary hypertension and there is a uh, risk of Eisenmenger physiology in a short period of time. And apart from that, uh, what, are, what are the other things that you have to know? You can have flow murmurs. Two flow murmurs are possible. One is mid-diastolic murmur. In the apex, that is because of high flow across the mitral valve. And second is ejection systolic murmur in the left upper sternal border in the pulmonary area. Again, because of high pulmonary blood flow. This is because of high uh, uh, mitral blood flow from LA to LV. And this is because of high pulmonary blood flow across the like pulmonary valve. So that's the reason you hear ESM. So these are not very important. So this is the most important, the shunt murmur. And what are the indications for repair when it comes to PST? So which carries more risk of infective endocarditis, VSD or ASD? You're going to answer. So ASD, more risk of paradoxical embolism. VSD usually is not going to increase risk of paradoxical embolism, but VSD is associated with more risk of infective endocarditis. Again, the risk of infective endocarditis depends on the gradient, the pressure gradient between two chambers. So pressure gradient between LA and RA is very negligible. That's why if they ask you which condition is least associated with infected endocarditis, answer is ASD. ASD is least associated with infected endocarditis. But VSD, high risk of infected endocarditis because the pressure gradient across RV and LV during systole is very high and that can, that's going to damage that area, that uh, shunt area, and that can result in development of infected endocarditis. So why I told this? Because that becomes an indication for repair. So number one, the shunt of fraction is what you're going to see. That's called as QPQS ratio, which means we're going to see the ratio of pulmonary blood flow to systemic blood flow. How much blood is going into the pulmonary area and how much blood is going into the systemic area from the left ventricle. If the ratio is more than 2 is to 1. Or we can say if the ratio is more than 2, QPQS ratio. In the sense, the pulmonary blood flow is twice as high as the systemic blood flow. That's an indication for repair irrespective of the symptoms. Number two, if the patient is having history of infective endocarditis, which means that uh, pressure gradient is very high, the area is getting damaged, and that's an indication for closure. And uh, number three, if the pain is having evidence of LV enlargement, LV dilatation. Of course, heart failure signs, 100% is a like indication for closure, but these are subtle indications. QPQS ratio more than two, history of infected endocarditis, and any evidence of LV enlargement is an indication for closure in the setting of VST. Okay, all right. So that completes our important points with regards to ventricular septal defect also. Now let us talk a little bit about patent ductus arteriosus or otherwise called as persistent patent ductus, patent ductus arteriosus. Dr. Archil is asking about QPQS ratio. So it's nothing but Q means flow, P means pulmonary, S means systemic. We are comparing the pulmonary flow with systemic flow. If the pulmonary blood flow is twice as high as the systemic blood flow, which means there is a lot of pulmonary blood flow. So because of like high level shunting, so that's a risk factor for development of like uh, Eisenmenger in the future. That's why we are repairing it earlier, which means it's a large defect. That's what it means. So QPQS means ratio to pulmonary to systemic blood flow. What to do in Eisenmenger syndrome? I told you Eisenmenger syndrome, you can't do anything. It's only palliative care. Once you develop Eisenmenger, the shunt reverses. Closure of shunt is contraindicated. It's only palliative care from there on. 
So you have to just uh, treat the patient till they die. Or theoretically speaking, the best treatment will be like combined heart and lung transplant, which is practically not feasible. So you can't do that practically. It's very, very difficult to do a combined heart and liver transplant. That's the theoretical option. But uh, most, of the, uh, most, of, most of the times in practical scenarios, like we're just going to treat them palliatively. So what marks the beginning of Eisenmenger in exam? So which will tell you that the patient has started developing Eisenmenger syndrome. Clinically, the most important clue is the fact that the murmurs will come down. Murmurs will come down. The intensity of the shunt murmurs will come down and the flow murmurs will come down and slowly it will disappear. The murmurs will disappear. Slowly, slowly it will disappear. And number two, patient will start developing cyanosis. Patient will start developing clubbing. And most of the patients will start developing polycythemia. So remember, once the shunt reverses, the venous blood is mixing with arterial blood. Once the shunt reverses, the venous blood is mixing with arterial blood. So do you think the risk of paradoxical embolism is higher or lower? The shunt reverses, the venous blood is mixing with arterial blood. So the risk of paradoxical embolism is higher or lower? Very, very high. So in any synotic congenital heart disease, in any synotic congenital heart disease, because of the mixing of the venous blood with arterial blood, the risk of embolism, thromboembolic manifestation is very, very high. The moment you have synotic congenital heart disease due to any reason, because that itself tells you you are mixing venous blood with arterial blood. So that clearly tells you the risk of thromboembolism is very, very high. Do you understand or not? So this is not only true for Eisenmenger. This is true for any con synotic congenital heart disease. Are you understanding? Yes or no? Yes, right? So now let us move on to PD. That is patent ductus arteriosus or we can call it as persistent patent ductus arteriosus. So what is the basic problem in uh, patent ductus arteriosus? So you are going to have a kind of a communication okay, between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So where that communication will be? So this is a normal ductus artery. It's not like basically an abnormal thing. So in the fetal circulation, you know that this is going to be quite normal. So the aorta is going to get uh, a connection. It's going to have a connection, communication to the pulmonary artery, typically with the main pulmonary artery or sometimes slightly to the like uh, left pulmonary artery. So but predominantly with the pulmonary artery and where in the descending aorta from the descending aorta descending aorta and remember this is the left subclavian this is the left subclavian so anatomically speaking the descending aorta is going to start like immediately after the left subclavian the moment your left subclavian is uh, given off you have the origin of the descending aorta so technically ductus is going to act as a communication between the descending aorta and probably the main pulmonary artery or some textbooks will say that to the left pulmonary artery so that doesn't really make any difference. So, but it's a kind of a communication. It's a normal communication in utero. This is a normal part of the fetal communication. Everyone knows that it's very important. And uh, what is the reason for the ductus? It's very simple. It has to divert the uh, blood away from the pulmonary circuit because inside the mother's womb, the pulmonary circuit is not functioning. The lungs are not functioning. So you don't want the blood to move into the pulmonary circuit. Rather, this is the one that's going to divert the blood away from the pulmonary circuit into the systemic circulation. So that is, yes, because of high pulmonary That's the reason for your ductus arteriosus to exist in the fetus. Okay. So who's going to keep the uh, ductus open? So who's going to keep the ductus open? So there's an important molecule that they tend to ask. Obviously, everyone knows that. So what is that molecule? So if you want a clue, I can say it's a prostaglandin. Yes, it's prostaglandin. But what prostaglandin? So what prostaglandin? Yes, PG2. Correct. PG2. PG2. Prostaglandin, that's perfectly right. PG2. PG2 is the one that's going to keep the ductus open, to be honest. And who's going to close the ductus after birth? Closure is normal after birth, right? So who's going to close after birth? So two things will close after birth. One, of course, reduce PG2. That's going to cause closure of ductus. Yes, second is oxygen. Correct. Only two things. Increase oxygen tension and reduction in the prostaglandin E2. So these are two things that are going to basically close the ductus after birth. Typically closes shortly after birth. Within a few days, it's going to close. And so what is the hemodynamics over here? It's pretty simple. And once again, like there's going to be an abnormal communication between aorta and the pulmonary artery that's going to persist even after birth. That's what's called as persistent patent ductus arteriosus. So that's going to increase the Pulmonary blood flow, you're going to have increased pulmonary blood flow. 
but do you think there's going to produce any flow murmur in the pulmonary area? Think about it one more time. Do you think you're going to have any increased flow across the pulmonary area? No. So you're not going to have any flow murmur across the pulmonary artery. You're not going to have any flow murmur. That's a very important point. So there's a different communication altogether, not like what you think usually. And by default, whatever blood that initially flows uh, into the pulmonary circulation is going to come back. It's going to come back and it's going to come back to the left atrium. So your LA and LV volume is going to increase. Are you understanding or not? Your LA and LV volume, like what we have seen in BST, is going to increase. So here also you're going to have increased LA volume. LA will be volume overload and subsequently your LV volume is also going to increase. Your LV is also going to be volume overload. And obviously the most important murmur is going to be the murmur of the shunt, the PDA shunt, which will be a kind of a continuous murmur. Why continuous murmur? Because aortic pressure is going to be higher than the pulmonary artery pressure in both systole as well as diastole. Whether it's systole or diastole, it doesn't matter. Aortic pressure is always higher. Okay, so that's why you're going to have a continuous flow across the ductus and you're going to hear a continuous murmur. You're going to hear a continuous murmur and often it will be missionary. That's what they're going to describe. Missionary murmur. And where you're going to hear this murmur? Typically in the Gibson's area, not in the left upper sternal border. That's called as Gibson's area. Where is Gibson's area? It is left upper sternal border only, but away from the sternum. I'll repeat, it's left upper sternal border only. Okay, but away from the sternum. It's not close to the sternum. Close to the sternum is classic left upper sternal border. But it will be slightly away from the sternum. So that area is often referred to as Gibson's area where you typically hear the murmur of patent ductus arteriosus. That continuous murmur. Classic. And of course, what are the other features of high pulmonary blood flow? So theoretically speaking, sorry, not pulmonary blood flow, other features of high LALV blood flow. You can answer yourself. Because of increased flow across the mitral valve, S1 may be loud, of course. S1 may be loud. Number two, patients can have, yes, a flow MDM across the mitral area, mitral valve. In the apex, they can have a flow MDM because of high flow across the mitral valve. Yes, plus or minus patients can theoretically have an opening stamp. Even though like you don't answer this commonly in exam, you're going to go for MS or TS if you're going to hear opening stamp. But theoretically speaking, patients can have an opening stamp as well. And here LV is volume overloaded. So LV is volume overloaded. So the apex will be hyperdynamic and dilated or heaving and non-displaced. Hyperdynamic and displaced or heaving and non-displaced. It's going to be hyperdynamic apex. And it will be displaced, of course, because there is volume overload. So it's going to be a displaced apex. Down and out, displacement will be there. And of course, uh, what is the extra sound that you're going to hear? Because of LV dilatation, LV volume overload, you will answer yourself. Pretty much easier, straightforward. Yes, you're going to have a left ventricular third heart sound. Straightforward, because of LV volume overload. This is very, very common in the setting of PDA. And look at the split. So split sometimes, you know, like, uh, can be confusing over here. So the, what will be the split basically here? You might not like understanding that. Split will be narrow or even reversed. That's a very important point. Split will be narrow or even reversed here. The reason is the shunting occurs in the distal region. Okay. Shunting occurs in the distal region. So in VSD, the shunt has occurred in the ventricular level itself. The shunt has occurred in the ventricular level itself. So that's why you had more flow across the pulmonary valve. That's why the P2 was late. So here, the flow is occurring across the aortic valve. Then the blood comes into the aorta, then slightly in the descending aorta only, the blood is moving into the pulmonary circulation. So what is the flow across the pulmonary valve? Can you tell me what is the flow across the pulmonary valve? It's actually reduced or normal. What is the flow across the pulmonary valve? It's actually quite reduced. It's not even normal. It's actually reduced because a lot of blood is actually going into the, from the aorta into the pulmonary circulation. Why reduced? Because most of the blood is actually coming back to the LA, isn't it? Through the pulmonary circulation. Okay. So it has to go through aorta. For example, for the RA and RV to receive enough blood, your blood has to go into aorta 
from aorta it has to go into the systemic circulation it has to form the veins from the veins it has to come back to the right atrium and the right ventricle so midway the blood is flowing more into the pulmonary vessels so because it's going into the pulmonary vasculature do you think the amount of blood coming back into ra and rv via the aorta and the systemic circulation is going to be less or more you tell me it's going to be reduced or more loknath rath is asking this question why reduced so of course it's going to be reduced right so because a lot of blood midway in the aorta itself is shunted into the pulmonary circulation so technically here the flow across the pulmonary valve is quite reduced it's less and because of more blood flow into the left ventricle you're going to have increased flow across aorta or reduced flow across aorta and there is no vsd here there's nothing to like push the blood into the right ventricle so the flow across the aortic valve is going to be increased so a2 will be delayed okay but p2 will come closer so that's the reason why sometimes you can have a narrow split or even a paradoxical split that's called as a reversed split so what i'm going to write is a2 p2 like this so what can happen is because of late a2 okay and sometimes p2 can occur earlier patient can even have what a reverse split or a paradoxical split in patients with your pd so remember in vsd you're going to have a wide split narrow split will occur only when the patient develops pulmonary hypertension but here naturally itself pda will produce a narrow split or a reverse split only even without pulmonary hypertension are you understanding or not so the hemodynamics itself will tell you the answer yes or no are you understanding i hope you will yes so now let us uh, see about the types of pda so types means we have preterm children producing pda and term children having pda which has to be treated urgently the preterm pda has to be treated urgently or the term pda has to be treated urgently both pdas has to be treated urgently but term pdas are more dangerous usually that will have some associated congenital malformations having a pda in preterm infants is like quite common so that can be treated more conservatively non urgently but term pdas has to be treated very uh, like urgently because usually most of the times the term pdas will have some associated congenital malformations also so hemodynamics you know the main problem is increased pulmonary blood flow and that is going to be associated with increased la and lv flows and that's the main problem and that's the reason why you develop pulmonary hypertension over a period of time and uh, you're going to develop eisenmenger syndrome if it's left uncorrected and so what are the clinical manifestations pulse typically like hyper kinetic pulse because of forcible lv contraction and patients will be having increased pulse volume so we can say like uh, large volume pulse because all the blood from aorta is going to move into part of pulmonary circulation and then into the um, peripheral areas and, and then in the pulmonary blood flow and into the aorta so you're going to technically have a large volume and a bounding pulse classic in a patient with patent ductus arteriosus and uh, uh, patients going to have a collapsing pulse also collapsing pulse here that's very important so you can hear the same uh, you can feel the same watson's water hammer pulse in patients with a uh, pda also so decrease pulse in lower limbs not really so that will be taken care by the ventricle no need to worry about that so in the upper limbs only we are talking about so pulse in the lower limbs will be okay okay it will be normal it will not be actually decrease in the lower limbs that is because the ventricle is hyperdynamic because the ventricular contraction is forcible and the ventricle is pushing a lot of blood outside to compensate for the blood that is moving into the pulmonary circulation so technically your lower limb blood flow will not be basically reduced to be honest rather it will be okay it will be normal but upper limbs because your upper limb vessels are like uh, quite proximal you're going to have a bounding pulse like increased uh, volume of the pulse as well why hyperkinetic we have been discussing for so long so your lv contraction is like powerful here it's harder it's contracting very briskly because it receives more volume whenever there is more volume according to frank starling law you're going to have more force of contraction so if there is more force of contraction there will be rapid rise that's what we called as hyperkinetic pulse why large volume because the vent uh, like the ventricles are ejecting a large volume of blood and if you look at the upper limb vessels they are actually originating much before the ductus itself the upper limb vessels like subclavian and all are originating much before the ductus itself 
So obviously, all of this blood is going to move, in, move into those upper limb vessels and you're going to have a large volume pulse because of more volume of blood that is moving into the higher and into the upper limb vessels. So you're going to technically have a large volume pulse only. But the question is, what I was supposed to ask is why collapsing? You're going to have a rapid rise and a rapid fall. So that is what we call as collapsing pulse. That is what we call as collapsing pulse, which means you're going to have a rapid fall. So why you're going to have a rapid fall, like in aortic regurgitation, there is something called as, um, we, we study in aortic regurgitation. What do we study? We study something called runoff, right? So there's going to be central runoff and there's going to be peripheral runoff. Peripheral runoff. So what is the reason for central runoff? The blood is not staying in the aorta. Rather, it is moving into the pulmonary circulation via the ductus. So that's why you're going to have central runoff where the blood doesn't stay in the aorta so that the pulse will collapse rapidly. On the other hand, because of like hyperdynamic LV, because of like LV is pounding and thrashing the peripheral vessels like anything because of its hyperdynamicity, you're going to have in uh, peripheral vasodilation that's going to reduce the systemic vascular resistance. And this is because of peripheral vasodilation, like in aortic regurgitation. For the same reason, you're going to have a collapsing pulse. The same Watson's water hammer pulse can be seen in patients with PDA also. So pulse is going to be like hyperkinetic, large volume, or we can call it as bounding pulse, especially in the upper limb vessels, because upper limb vessels originate much before the ductus. And you're going to have uh, the collapsing nature of the pulse, otherwise called as Watson's water hammer pulse. Typically, JVP will be normal. Once the JVP starts increasing, it indicates that the patient has developed pulmonary hypertension, which is going to have a kind of a large A wave. We have discussed this time and again. I'm not going to discuss again. What about the uh, epical impulse? Epical impulse will be like uh, hyperdynamic, hyperdynamic, and displaced. We have discussed that already. I'm not going to explain again. It will be a down and out epical impulse and it will be typically a LV epical impulse because LV will be dilated. And what about S1, S2? Of course, you can have a loud first heart zone because of increased flow across the mitral valve and patients can have um, a opening snap also. Theoretically possible. Practically, it's not important, but theoretically possible. And this is again a mitral opening snap because of increased flow across the mitral valve. And apart from that, uh, patients are going to have a kind of a narrow or a reverse splitting of the second heart zone narrow or the reverse splitting of the second heart zone so of course once again if they mention that the patient is having loud p2 or palpable p2 i need to think about pulmonary hypertension loud p2 or palpable p2 i need to think about pulmonary hypertension so s2 normally itself will be narrow split or reverse split in the setting of patent ductus heart reverses. what about the extra sounds technical i should have written extra sounds over here so sorry for that i should not have written here because here we have to talk about only S1 and S2. Okay, so extra sounds the sense patients can develop opening snap as I said, theoretically possible, and this is a kind of a mitral opening snap. And very commonly, patients are going to have left ventricular third heart zone. So, diffuse cyanosis in the lower limb is just theoretical. No, no, no. Once the patient develops Heisenmenger, patients can develop differential cyanosis of the lower limb. I'll come back to that. So, what is the murmur that you're going to hear? You're going to hear a continuous murmur. LVS3 will be heard better in the apex. We know that. So, continuous murmur. Continuous murmur. So, continuous murmur is also called as Gibson's murmur and it will be typically heard in the Gibson's area. Gibson's area. Slowly, slowly, once the patient develops Eisenmenger syndrome, the murmur will come down and it will disappear. Which component of the murmur will disappear first if the patient starts developing Eisenmenger? Diastolic component or systolic component? So, initially, you're going to have a continuous murmur. But once the patient starts developing Eisenmenger syndrome, which component of the murmur will disappear? Which component of the continuous murmur will disappear? Systolic or diastolic? Obviously, by logic, the diastolic component will disappear first. Then slowly, slowly, the systolic component also will disappear. Over time, there will be a complete disappearance of the murmur. And that marks our uh, onset of full-blown Eisenmenger physiology and cyanosis. That's it. Somebody is asking about differential cyanosis. Tell me, so look at this diagram. So in case if the shunt reverses, so, usual direction of flow is like this, from aorta into the pulmonary artery. But if the shunt reverses, the blood from pulmonary artery, if the shunt reverses, the blood from pulmonary artery is going to go into the aorta. Go into the aorta. If the shunt reverses, it's going to go from pulmonary artery into the aorta. So, you think 
the upper limb vessels will be affected because of this mixing or selectively the lower limb vessels will be affected because of this mixing. Which group of vessels will be affected? Only selectively lower limb vessels will be affected because of this mixing, right? So it's not the upper limb vessels. So this is what we refer to as something called as differential cyanosis. This is what we call as differential cyanosis. One example of differential cyanosis is PDA with shunt reversal, which means PDA with Eisenmenger syndrome. In PDA with shunt reversal, you are going to have differential cyanosis of the lower limbs alone. You won't have cyanosis of the upper limbs. Are you understanding or not? So why you have a differential cyanosis once the patient develops Eisenmenger syndrome? Yes. So what are the indications for repair? So indications for repair is very, very simple and straightforward here. It depends on whether the patient is a preterm infant or whether the patient is a term infant. If you are dealing with a preterm infant, if you're dealing with a preterm infant, you're going to opt for more conservative management. You're going to opt for more conservative management. So conservative in the sense, like I'm going to use only NSAIDs, either a brufen or a endomethacin. Basically, the PG2 is the one that keeps the ductus open. So I'm going to give NSAID. So NSAIDs to reduce the production of PG2 so that the ductus will close automatically. But this is not given for all the patients. This is given only for those preterm infants who are on mechanical ventilator for at least one week. So those who are ventilator dependent. So those in preterm infants who are ventilator dependent and those who are on mechanical ventilator for more than one week at least, only in those situations I'm going to use like NSAIDs. Otherwise, I can just observe these patients. Automatic ductus will close over a period of time. In case if I'm dealing with a term child, I'm dealing with a term child, so there are some specific indications for closure. It has to be treated a little urgently. One of the important indications for closure is LALV enlargement. LALV enlargement. Number two, infective endocarditis. Or if there is evidence of pulmonary hypertension, I have to start closing immediately. But remember, if the shunt has reversed, if the shunt has reversed, closure is contraindicated. That's a common rule for all left directions. Once the shunt has reversed, once the patient has developed Eisenmenger syndrome, closure is absolutely contraindicated. I cannot do that. When, when you talk about pulmonary hypertension, means there's a subtle pulmonary hypertension, but it has not resulted in reversal of shunt yet. So in that situation, I can close. Most of the situations, I'm going to opt for a percutaneous closure, but in some situations, I can use a uh, surgical closure methods also, but most situations, percutaneous itself, they can close the ductus. So indications for term infants, LALV enlargement, evidence of infected endocarditis because PDA is also a condition that has high risk of infected endocarditis because the gradient across iotan pulmonary artery is very high. So there is a risk of damage to the uh, ductus in that area and that can get infected, result in infected endocarditis and those who are having evidence of pulmonary emanation, but the shunt should not be reversed. So if it has reversed, contraindicated. So this is about your patent ductus arteriosus. Now let us talk a little bit about another important area that is coarctation of iota. This is also something that's very commonly asked in exams. So what is basically coarctation of iota? It is just a narrowing of a portion of the iota. So narrowing of the portion of the iota. The usual position uh, where there will be narrowing is exactly at the location of the ductus. Where the ductus was there, uh, in most situations, that is the place where you're going to have narrowing of the iota. That's a very, very important point. So that's where you're going to have the narrowing, predominantly in most situations. So that's where the coax segment is going to be, which means it's just distal to the left subclavian, just distal to the left subclavian. But the position can be uh, different also. It can be like a little proximal also, which can result in very severe coarctation. They can present in infantile period itself or in neonatal period itself. But the classic location for coarctation is going to be like, yes, just distal to the left subclavian at the site of insertion of the ductus arteriosus. Yes, embolism said that uh, uh, juxtaductal and that's the right statement. It's going to be juxtaductal. So what is the usual association? Usual association of coarctation of iota is going to be bicuspid aortic valve. Simply, I can write as BAV. BAV stands for bicuspid aortic valve. And one congenital problem that's associated with coarctation commonly is Turner's syndrome. It's a chromosomal abnormality, right? So Turner's syndrome. Turner's syndrome is also quite commonly associated with coarctation of iota. And another important association that you have to notice, around like 10-20% of the patients will be having barrier aneurysms. So these patients are at risk of 
subarachnoid hemorrhage also. Some patients will have associated perianeurysms. So once these rupture, so they can now develop uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage also. This can later on result in subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we have discussed already, whenever there is a narrowing of a portion of any vessel, so of course the velocity is going to increase in that area, but what will happen to proximal pressures? This is proximal, this is distal. So what will happen to the proximal pressures? It will increase or it will decrease? It will increase or decrease? Yeah, obviously proximal pressures will increase. We have discussed it already. And distal pressures are going to decrease. And the difference in pressure is what we are going to call it as something called as pressure gradient. We discussed that already. So over time, what happens? This gradient will slowly come down. Why? Because this pressure gradient is going to like drive the formation of collaterals. There will be vessels coming from that proximal segment and distal segment. There will be vessels. And over time, what happens is the collaterals will start appearing. The collaterals will start appearing. So that is going to push the blood from the high pressure region to a low pressure region. So now you tell me, so once the collaterals develop, the gradient will come down or the gradient will still remain the same. So this collaterals between this high pressure vessels and low pressure vessels are going to push the blood from a region of higher pressure to a region of lower pressure. So once the blood starts flowing from this region to this region, what will happen to the gradient? So that's a very important concept. The collaterals actually are driven by the gradient. The formation of collaterals are driven by the gradient. But once the collaterals are formed, the gradient will slowly come down. Yes, once the collaterals are formed, the gradient will come down. And this collateral flow will be continuous flow or only systolic flow or only diastolic flow. This collateral flow will be a continuous flow or only a systolic flow or a diastolic flow. It's continuous flow. It's not systolic, it's not diastolic because aorta has a systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure. So the pressure in the proximal segment is going to be more throughout systole and diastole. And the low pressure is going to occur continuously during both systole and diastole. So the collateral flow is basically going to be continuous. It's not systolic, it's not diastolic. That's the reason the murmur of collaterals will be continuous murmur or systolic murmur or diastolic murmur. The murmur of collaterals will be a continuous murmur or systolic murmur or diastolic murmur. Yes, that's correct. The collateral murmur is going to be a continuous murmur. Okay. The flow across the coacted segment can result in an ejection systolic murmur. The flow across the coacted segment can be an ejection systolic murmur. But technically, you are going to have a con uh, uh, continuous murmur across the collaterals. Okay. All right. So this is done. So what are the different types of coactation that we have? So we have something called as preductal coactation and we have something called as postductal coactation. We have preductal and we have postductal coactation. Which is more dangerous? Preductal coactation or postductal coactation? Which is going to present very early in the infantile. The more proximal the coactation is, more dangerous it is. So technically, the preductal coactation will be usually severe and they're going to present early. It's going to have a very early presentation. Neonates itself is going to present with heart failure. So presentation depends on when they present. If they present in the neonatal age group, which means the coactation is very severe, the obstruction is very severe. So the LV is not able to pump against the obstruction. So patients are going to present with heart failure. This is called as critical coactation of aorta. This is also called as critical coactation of aorta. Patients are going to have LV failure because LV is struggling. It's not able to push against the obstruction. The coactation is very severe. So heart failure will occur when? Once the PDA closes or once the P, I mean, if the PDA is open, heart failure will occur or once the PDA closes, heart failure will occur. When the heart failure will occur, look at this diagram. If the ductus closes, heart failure will occur or if the ductus is open, heart failure will be there. Yes. Once the PDA closes, heart failure is very, very common. Once the ductus closure, heart failure is very, very common. That is because till that the LV can somehow like reduce its load by pushing the blood into the pulmonary circulation. But once the ductus closes, if the obstruction is severe, LV has to somehow pass through that obstruction where like over time it may fail if the obstruction is severe. So that's why usually most of the patients will develop heart failure once the ductus has closed. A very important point. In case if the patients 
are presenting as an infant or a child, infant or a child, most of them will be just presenting with hypertension, predominantly hypertension. So they can have plus or minus chest pain, plus or minus claudication in the lower limbs, especially because of reduced blood flow in the lower limbs. But most of the time, they're going to present with hypertension. And what's the classic feature of coagulation of fighter related hypertension? Your upper limb BP will be increased. Your upper limb BP will be increased and your lower limb BP will be normal or reduced. So your lower limb BP will be normal or reduced. So you're going to have a definite uh, difference in blood pressure between upper and lower limbs. And whenever it's more than 20 millimeters of mercury, it is significant. It is significant. One of the important causes of difference in pressure between upper and lower limbs is your coagulation of fire Okay, so you're going to have high pressure in the upper limbs because the upper limb vessels are proximal to the coagulation. They're going to have normal to low BP in the lower limbs because the lower limb like vessels are originating distally, distal to coagulation. So that's the concept here. So that's why the difference in pressure between upper and lower limb of more than 20 millimeters of mercury is very, very common in the setting of coagulation of fire That's classic. And why chest pain? Chest pain is basically because of severe left ventricular hypertrophy. And that's going to create a kind of a demand supply mismatch. That's going to produce chest pain because of relative ischemia. And claudication will typically occur in the lower limbs. That is because of reduced blood flow. Reduced blood flow to the lower limbs. Patients can develop lower limb claudication. This is possible. This is the presentation usually in infants and children. And older adults. If they are presenting late means the obstruction is not very severe. That's what it means. And most of the patients are going to present with hypertension probably they are going to complain of headache because of increased cerebral blood flow because the pressure in the cerebral vessels is also going to be higher because these vessels are originating proximally, proximal to obstruction. So because of high pressures in the cerebral vasculature, you're going to have headache. Plus or minus these patients can have claudication as well. These patients can present with claudication also because of lower blood flow to the lower limbs. Okay, so this is going to be the presentation. And another classic point that an examiner might accept, expect is Radiofemoral delay. So this is classic in a coagulation. You can understand why radiofemoral delay. We noticed that uh, in aortic stenosis, there is epicocarotid delay. I told you already, delayed carotid pulses, delayed peaking of carotid pulses, epicocarotid delay in patients with aortic stenosis. In the last chapter itself, we discussed. But in the setting of coagulation of aorta, the classic finding is going to be radiofemoral delay. Okay, it's going to be kind of radiofemoral delay. Okay, so you can understand why. So neonates typically heart failure, if at all depressant, infants and children typically hypertension plus or minus chest pain or plus or minus claudication. Adults typically hypertension again, they can have headache also, they can have claudication also depending on the severity of obstruction. So what are the indications for repair? Another very, very important question for exam. In fact, for uh, need PJ9 ACT, this is what the question you're going to get. So it can be either surgical repair or percutaneous repair also. So first indication, any neonatal presentation, neonates with critical coagulation, if they're having heart failure, 100% they have to repair. Number two, in adults, what are the indications for repair? Number one, if the patient is having a gradient of more than 20 millimeters of mercury, you know what is gradient, right? So the difference between the proximal pressure and the distal pressure, this is what we call as the gradient. If the gradient is more than 20 millimeters of mercury, that's an indication for repair, indication for repair of coagulation and apart from the gradient if the patient is having evidence of collateral flow the pain is having evidence of collateral flow even if the gradient is less than 20 you have to definitely uh, repair it because you know that once the collateral starts once the collateral flow starts the gradient is going to come down once the collateral flow starts the gradient is going to come down so that's why gradient doesn't matter once the collaterals have started or if the pain is having uncontrolled hypertension or the patient is having evidence of heart failure. These are also indications for closure. Uh, in, so not closure, indications of repair of coagulation of aorta in adults. That's it. So gradient more than 20, evidence of collateral flow, presence of hypertension or presence of heart failure. So these are the classic indications for repair. So what I'm going to do? Most cases, I'm going to do percutaneous repair only. If I'm opting for percutaneous repair, I'm going to do something called as balloon dilatation balloon angioplasty so that's all this is more than enough this is the procedure that we usually do in most cases it's going to be balloon angioplasty just dilate that coax segment and come back that's all so that's the usual technique that we perform in practice balloon angioplasty or simply balloon dilatation that's all 
And uh, one more important point I forgot to say is, yeah, PG, E2, yes, it can be provided. So till you do definitely repair, I told you the heart failure is going to occur. In neonates, heart failure is going to occur in neonates once the ductus closes. So the patient is having severe heart failure as a neonate, as a neonate, at that time, you can actually keep the ductus open to reduce the heart failure. So that is possible. So by using like uh, certain drugs, the drug is called as alparastodil. We'll talk about that. In some cases, we want to keep the ductus open. So for that purpose, we are going to use a drug called as alparastodil, which is a prostaglandin analog, alparastodil. Okay, I was about to tell one more thing, yeah, one more important clinical sign. You yourself said that the murmur of ductus is going to be kind of uh, continuous murmur. Sorry, uh, murmur of coactation of collaterals of coactation of phyta is going to be a continuous murmur. Where that murmur will be heard best and where these collaterals will be formed in the posterior region or anterior region, where you're going to see the collaterals better it's because of coactation, posterior or anterior. Posterior anterior, where are you going to see the collaterals? Yes, collaterals in coactation means always it's posterior. It's not anterior, it's always posterior, almost always posterior. So you're going to hear the murmur of these collaterals best in the posterior regions, in the infrascapular region, and that is what we call the Suzman sign. So this can be asked in exam, Suzman sign. So what is Suzman sign? Continuous murmur because of collaterals of coactation of aorta in the infrascapular region, in the posterior region. So that's what we call the Suzman sign. And uh, of course, you know, like uh, in chest X-ray, you can see the rib notching. Can you say me, rib notching will be common in posterior ribs or anterior ribs? Rib notching. Of course, these are called as posterior rib notching. I told you so many times, collaterals, posterior. So we're going to see posterior rib notching. And where the rib notching will be classic, in typically in ribs three to nine, because of the anatomy, I cannot explain that. You can read anatomy by yourself, but that's not really required. You don't want to waste a lot of time. So just remember that ribs 3 to 9 is the usual location of the notching. Okay. In the setting of collaterals of coagulation of aorta. So you're going to have posterior rib notching, 3 to 9 ribs. Very important. Yes, the inferior rib notching, of course. Uh, why inferior? Because the neurovascular bundle is located on the inferior side. Obviously, you can see in this image, it's basically an inferior rib notching, postero inferior rib notching, not superior. And uh, here's an example of the figure of three sign. So sometimes you can notice something called as figure of three sign. So the, the area of three, you know, like that uh, joining point. So that's going to tell the site of coactation. That's going to be the site of coactation. So... That's what is going to give rise to the classic figure of three side in X-rays. So that's it about coagulation of aorta. So now I, I think this is the uh, final congenital heart disease that's kind of more important. Other things we can just brush it upon. So uh, what we're going to discuss is tetralogy of phallate. So I told you TOF is going to come under something called as phallate's physiology. So phallate's physiology is different. We know what is Eisenmenger physiology. Now we're going to talk about phallate physiology. As I tell, told, anyone with a large VST with a pulmonic stenosis is going to follow phallate physiology. That's all. Large VST plus PS, that's enough to follow phallate physiology. So technically, what are the components of tetralogy of phallate? You're going to have, first of all, you have to say it's a large VST. That's the most important, the most important component along with pulmonic stenosis, the most important component again. Along with that, other components are just like reaction to these problems, like right ventricular hypertrophy. That is because of pulmonic stenosis. So what pulmonic stenosis is going to cause? Pulmonic stenosis is going to cause a kind of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And that's going to result in RVH because of pressure overload. And yes, you are correct. This pulmonic stenosis will be infundibular pulmonic stenosis. So we can use the term subpulmonic stenosis, but it's better to use the term called as infundibular pulmonic stenosis. So it's basically not a valvular PS, a very, very important point. It's basically not a valvular pulmonic stenosis. Very important point. If it's not a valvular pulmonic stenosis, do you think you're going to have a valvular ejection click? Valvular ejection click. Are you going to see here? If it's not a valvular PS, it's an infundibular PS. That's a very important point, actually. You never hear any ejection click in the setting of pulmonic stenosis due to TOF because it's basically not a valvular PS. It's an infundibular PS. It's subvalvular. It's not valvular. So no valvular ejection click. Very important point. 
And apart from RVH, some patients can have overriding of IATA as well. Overriding of IATA, where IATA can uh, ride over the right ventricle to some extent. So these are all just reactive components. These are not that important. So what is more important is going to be these two components, infundibular PS and large VST. If it is there, you're going to follow Fallot's physiology. As simple as that. So look at this. So what's occurring here? You're having a kind of infundibular PS. This is an infundibular pulmonic stenosis. So you're going to have high resistance in the pulmonary circuit. And the blood is going to mix with the help of a large VSD and it's going to go into the iota. So this is the reason for cyanosis in these patients. Initially, you don't have a continuous cyanosis. Patients are going to only have cyanotic spells. So patients are going to only have episodic cyanosis. So for the first six months, first of all, no cyanosis. They don't develop cyanosis in the first six months. Can you say why patients don't develop cyanosis in the first six months? Patients don't develop cyanosis in the first three to six months. Can you say why? Can you say why? Yeah, guys, sorry. So what we have been talking, so first you don't have any cyanosis at all. The main reason why we don't have cyanosis is because of the hemoglobin F. So because the hemoglobin F for the first two to six months, for the first three to six months, you don't have any cyanosis at all. So, uh, and another reason why you don't have that much of cyanosis in the first three to six months is because you don't have that much of right ventricular hypertrophy. You won't have a severe right ventricular hypertrophy in the first three to six months because RVH will take some time to develop. So once the RVH comes into play, once the right ventricular contraction increases, and once the HBF comes down, or once the HBF disappears, you're going to result in onset of cyanosis. But in the first few years of life, maybe like around three, four years, till three, four years of time, the patient will have only episodic cyanosis, which is also called as cyanotic spells. Cyanotic spells. And after that, patients will start developing continuous cyanosis. After that, patients will start developing continuous cyanosis. So can you say why the patients are going to have episodic cyanosis or cyanotic spells is very simple. So let me draw a circuit over here. So this is an easier one to understand. So let me assume you're having a huge VST. So this is RV and this is LV. And uh, let me assume you're having a small hypoplastic pulmonary arterial trunk and there is a severe infundibular pulmonic stenosis and the pulmonary valves are located at this point but it doesn't matter you're having infundibular PS and you're going to have an overriding of the iota, which means a portion of the iota will be overriding the right ventricular wall as well. So with time, you all know that the patients are going to have left ventricular hypertrophy. Over time, they're going to develop left, right, sorry, right ventricular hypertrophy. Over time, they're going to develop right ventricular hypertrophy because of increased resistance at the right ventricular outflow tract. So because of RVOT obstruction and high resistance at the pulmonary outlet at the right ventricular outflow tract, they're going to develop right ventricular hypertrophy. So now there's going to be a kind of a balance initially. So only at some points, the mixing will increase. So that's typical Fallot's physiology. So initially what happens is whenever the pulmonary resistance increases, and the systemic resistance decreases, the blood is going to flow more into the iota and the mixing is going to increase. This is what is going to occur initially. So when the patient is going to develop cyanotic spells or episodic cyanosis, whenever the pulmonary vascular resistance increases and or the systemic vascular resistance decreases. 
This is the time where the mixing is going to increase. This is the time where the right sided blood and the left sided blood will mix. Right sided blood and left sided blood will mix across the large VST and you're going to result in mixing of the blood and cyanosis. So initially, whenever the pulmonary vascular resistance is low or the systemic vascular resistance is high, you're not going to have mixing. You won't have cyanosis. So that's the reason initially, initial part, they're going to have episodic cyanosis. Once the stenosis becomes very severe and fixed, and once the RVH becomes too bad, there'll be continuous mixing. After that, you will result in continuous cyanosis only. So can you tell me what are the conditions that are going to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance and are probably that's going to decrease the systemic vascular resistance so that you're going to end up with cyanosis? What's going to be the triggering event? We call it a cyanotic spells or sometimes they tend to call the cyanotic spells as TED spells also. Can you tell me? So what is the reason for increased pulmonary vascular resistance and uh, decreased uh, systemic vascular resistance? So anything literally. So for example, apneic spells. So children are prone for this apneic spells, right? So children are basically prone for this apneic spells. So definitely during apnea, there will be hypoxia. During hypoxia, there will be pulmonary vasoconstriction. That's called as oilless mechanism. That's called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. That's going to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. And that can result in more mixing of the blood. And that can result in cyanosis. So second is crying. During crying, of course, they don't breathe properly. And that's a kind of exercise. So crying or any exercise in the form of feeding, playing. So these are all things that can increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. And at the same time, they can reduce the systemic vascular resistance. Because of that, you can result in cyanosis. So these are the triggers for cyanosis. Apneic spells, crying, any form of exercise like feeding, playing. So this can actually reduce SVR and increase PVR simultaneously so that you will result in more mixing and more blood flowing into the iota resulting in development of cyanosis. Are you understanding this diagram? So why whenever PVR increases and SVR decreases, you are having more mixing and you're going to cause cyanosis? Yes or no? And what is the reason for that episodic cyanosis in the first like four or five years of life? So after that, once the pulmonic stenosis becomes fixed and once the RVH becomes very severe, the mixing will become continuous and after that you will start developing continuous cyanosis. That's all. As simple as that. And if I ask you one question, despite having severe right ventricular hypertrophy, most of the patients will be having severe RVH, but these patients won't have any parasternal heaving. So parasternal heaving is a classic sign of RVH, pressure overload of the right ventricle. But this, this right ventricle is actually hypertrophied quite badly, but you don't have any parasternal heaving. If you examine this patient, the chest will be silent. No parasternal heaving. No parasternal heaving. Why? What is the reason? Yes, that's a very, very good answer because of large VST. Because of large VST. There will be a thumping sensation in the parasternal region. That's what we call it as parasternal heaving. Whenever the right ventricle is pressure overloaded because of like increased thickness of the right ventricular muscle, you're going to have something called as parasternal heaving. So that's a thumping sensation that you can feel in the right parasternal border, the left parasternal border. Okay, so that's parasternal heaving and uh, Usually, it's a common sign of RVH, but here, despite having a huge right ventricular hypertrophy, you're not going to have parasternal heaving. That's because of the large VST. The pressure will be easily shunted to the left ventricle. So that's why, despite having RVH, you don't have parasternal heaving. That's a very important point. can be asked in exams. And in a patient with tetralogy of fallot, uh, you're going to have a kind of relatively silent chest. You don't have that much of signs and so on. That is because, like, there will be pulmonary oligemia in these patients. You're having reduced pulmonary blood flow. You're not having increased pulmonary blood flow. Because of reduced flow, you're not overloading any ventricle. Only pressure load of the right ventricle is occurring. Even that is not producing parasternal heaving. And there is actually no volume overload of any particular chamber. And that's why you don't see that much of signs. And on top of that, there is pulmonary oligemia also. Because of reduced pulmonary blood flow, because of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. That's why you won't have that much of signs at all in patients with tetralogy of fallot. Rather, only one sign that you may notice is ejection systolic murmur in the pulmonic area. That is because of turbulent flow across the obstructed area. So only one sign that you can probably notice is ejection systolic murmur at the left upper sternal border, that is the pulmonary area. But tell me, when the patient develops 
cyanotic spells or dead spells, the murmur will disappear or murmur will persist. Who's going to answer? During dead spells or during cyanotic spells, the murmur will disappear or murmur will increase. Murmur will disappear because why you develop dead spells or cyanotic spells? Because of further reduction in the pulmonary blood flow, because of severe obstruction. So the blood cannot flow across the pulmonary valve and uh, across the right ventricle outflow tract. How you can develop as murmur? So remember, in any cyanotic disease, you're going to have disappearance of murmur. That's a common rule in cardiology. So here also same thing is going to occur. So what's going to mark the onset of the TED spell or cyanotic spell is the disappearance of the murmur. So most of the children during that cyanotic spells, they're not going to have murmur. The murmur will disappear. Another classic sign that you will notice is single S2. Single S2, which means the P2 will be absent. That is because of atresia of the pulmonary valve. In many patients, there will be a near complete atresia of the pulmonary valve because the pulmonary segment itself will be very poorly developed in most of the patients. That's why you're going to have something called a single S2. If you know these three things, it's more than enough. So large RVH, no personal living. Reason, large VST. ESM in the left upper spinal border, but it's going to disappear during cyanotic spells. And you're going to have a single S2 and that is because of absent pulmonary component of the second heart zone. And that is because of the like atresia of the pulmonary trunk, especially the pulmonary valve may not be there at all in some patients. Why murmur will disappear? Because of reduced flow across the pulmonary orifice, because of increased obstruction across the right ventricular outflow tract during cyanotic spells, pulmonary vascular resistance is very high, so blood will not move there. Rather, it's going to mix and move into the aorta, causing cyanosis. So blood flow across the aorta is more, but rather the blood flow across the pulmonary valve is reducing even further. So that's why the murmur will come down until disappear during cyanotic spells and dead spells. So when it comes to workup, so in chest x-ray, what you're going to notice is a boot-shaped heart and that is because of RVH, upturned apex. Everyone knows that you would have been studying for quite a long time. So this is because of severe right ventricular hypertrophy, upturned apex. And ECG, of course, is going to show a right ventricular hypertrophy plus or minus a right bundle branch block. So that's what you're going to see in ECG. This is non-specific finding. And um, uh, how will you manage? So remember in exam, most of the time, they're going to ask about the management of the cyanotic spells. They're going to ask about the management of cyanotic spells or probably the TED spells. That's what they're going to ask. So remember the reason for cyanotic spell, cyanotic cyanosis in TOF in the initial phase that there is episodic cyanosis is increased pulmonary vascular resistance and or a combination of reduced systemic vascular resistance. So we are planning to reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance and increase systemic vascular resistance. So we are preferentially moving the blood to pulmonary vasculature. So if you look at this diagram, you can understand if you increase the systemic vascular resistance and if you reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance, you can make the blood move towards the pulmonary circulation. That's going to relieve the cyanosis. So we are going to follow something called a stepwise protocol. In the first step, in the step one, I'm going to ask the child to adopt a knee chest position. Knee chest position. This is a kind of a squatting equivalent. So in this portion, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the systemic vascular resistance. Plus, at the same time, I can give oxygen. If I relieve hypoxia, that's going to reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance because hypoxia will cause pulmonary vasoconstriction and giving oxygen will cause pulmonary vasodilation. So it's going to reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance. In the step two, if the patient is still not like recovering properly, then I can use something called as IV morphine, which is a pulmonary venodilator. So it can reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. Plus, I can use a IV fluid bolus also to improve the pulmonary blood flow. To improve the pulmonary blood flow, I can use an IV fluid bolus. In the step three, I can give IV beta blocker. IV beta blocker, typically I'm going to use propranolol. So IV beta blocker can increase the systemic vascular resistance because if you give propranolol, propranolol, it has two effects. So the beta 2 property, beta 2 is going to vasodilate. The systemic vasculature, if I block beta 2 with propranolol, it's a non-selective beta blocker. I can cause slight bit of vasoconstriction, so it's going to increase systemic vascular resistance. On top of that, the beta 1, is one, once I block, I'm going to reduce the inotropicity. Inotropicity. So which means I'm going to reduce the force of contraction of right ventricle, which is very, very important for uh, like causing cyanosis in such situations. So if I cause reduced inotropicity, reduce contraction of the right ventricle, the amount of blood flowing into the iota will come down so that the sinuses will relieve. And at the same time, IV morphine as well as IV beta blockers can also relieve infantibular spasm to some extent.
can also relieve infantibular spasm to some extent. That's the reason why we are using these drugs. Plus, often people tend to use phenylephrine also, IV phenylephrine also, which is basically an alpha agonist. Because it's an alpha agonist, it's going to increase the systemic vascular resistance. Because of that, uh, my blood will uh, start uh, stop moving into the aortic orifice. Rather, it starts preferentially moving towards the pulmonary area so that I can improve the pulmonary blood flow, thereby relieving the sinuses. If still the patient is suffering from severe sinuses, sinuses is not getting relieved. In the step four, I can try palliative shunting. Palliative shunt procedures. The best example of a palliative shunt is going to be a blood toxic shunt. The best example of a palliative shunt is going to be a blood toxic shunt. So what is blood toxic shunt? You know, like blood toxic shunt is where we are going to divert the right or left subclavian artery uh, blood into the right or left pulmonary artery blood. That is blood toxic shunt. So look at this one. So what is blood toxic shunt? So if I make a shunt between uh, maybe a left subclavian with the left pulmonary or right subclavian with right pulmonary. So what I'm doing, I am actually shunting the blood from systemic circulation into the pulmonary circulation so that I'm increasing the pulmonary blood flow. This is what we called as blood toxic shunt. It can be done uh, like a kind of end-to-end -end, like connection surgically or you can use an artificial shunt also. If you use an artificial shunt, that's called as modified blood toxic shunt. So basically, these shunt procedures tend to increase the pulmonary blood flow. So once you increase the pulmonary blood flow, you are going to reduce the sinuses. You are going to relieve the sinuses. That is the overall idea of these shunt procedures. So this is an example that is called as blood toxic shunt. And we have other shunts also. Like for example, we have something called as rastelly shunt, which is what is commonly used in the modern practice. Rastelly shunt. So what is rastelly shunt? So rastelly shunt uh, is going to connect the right ventricle to the main pulmonary artery directly. So we're going to use a shunt that's going to connect the right ventricle to the main pulmonary artery directly. Right ventricle to the main pulmonary artery. So which means I'm going to bypass the infundibular PS, bypass the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Remember, uh, all we are talking about emergency situations. Here the child is dying because of cyanosis. And I cannot do like a uh, kind of a major surgery like VSD repair at that point of time. I need something urgent, some palliative surgery so that the child survives at that point of time. So I cannot do like a major surgery. VSD repair is a major surgery. Here the VSD is huge. It's a very large VSD. So it's very difficult to like uh, do at this point of time. It's a kind of a definitive surgery. So what I'm trying to do with the rastalition. So this is a rastalition. So what I'm going to do in rastalition, I'm going to shunt the blood from right ventricle directly into the main pulmonary artery so that I'm bypassing the shunt, bypassing the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction and pushing the blood into the pulmonary circulation so that my pulmonary blood flow increases and my sinuses is relieved. So this is what we called as rastelly shunt. So step four is basically palliative shunt. So I can try blood toxic or modified blood toxic or probably even rastelly shunt, whichever you feel is comfortable or whichever the surgeon feels comfortable with it. Okay, but you know the definitive repair has to be performed. Definitely repair. So whatever we have discussed are palliative shunts only. They are not definitive treatment. So definite repair has to be done. So definite repair should be done ideally at three to six months of age. Typically, ideal time where we do the definite repair is at three to six months of age. The earlier is better. And what we currently do is something called complete primary repair. Complete primary repair is what we are going to do. We are going to repair the infundibular PS and we are going to uh, completely close off the VST also. That's what we call as complete primary repair. So there are plenty of shunts. That's why I'm saying like these shunts are very low yielding areas for exams. This is not the only shunt. We have so many shunts with respect to TOF. So, but they're not very high yielding to be honest. So not very important. And look at this one. So this is a classic example of a boot shaped heart. It's a boot shaped heart. And that is because of a severe right ventricular hypertrophy. where you are going to have a kind of an upturned apex. That's classic of RVH. So you're going to have that uh, typical boot-shaped heart. So let me repeat the protocol for like treating cyanotic spells or TET spells. Step one, knee chest portion oxygen. Step two, IV morphine, IV fluids. Step three, IV beta blockers and phenylephrine. Step four, if it's still not responding, you're going to go for like palliative shunts at that point of time. But in case if you're planning for a definitive repair where you have to uh, relieve the infundibular stenosis, 
plus at the same time you have to like close off the vst also it should be done ideally at three to six months and currently we don't do any staged procedures we are going to do something called as a complete primary repair now coming to other like uh, important like cyanotic congenital heart disease like tga there are two forms of tga so that is called as um, dtga and second one is called as ltga so first let me uh, talk about dtga dtga is a classic form of tga i think everybody knows what are palliations palliations means is a temporary palliative procedure at that point of time i have to relieve the sinuses my masking what are palliations these are palliative procedures at that point i need to save the life of the child so that's my primary aim so how can i save the life of the child just by increasing the pulmonary blood flow so i have to do some emergency procedure not definitive repair emergency procedure so that my pulmonary blood flow is increased at that point of time so that the child is surviving later on maybe like once the child is better once the child's health is good maybe i can perform a definitive repair right now my idea is to save the life that's why it's called as palliative shunt just do some shunt increase the uh, blood flow to the pulmonary circulation that's all yes absolutely blood of toxic shunt is a palliative procedure it's not a definitive procedure definitive repair means you have to close the vsd and you have to relieve the infundibular ps also both has to be done so then then only you can say that the repair is complete here we are just shunting and diverting the blood towards the pulmonary circulation so that's basically palliative shunt so what is dtg so here you can have some, you, you can see something called as dtg or dextro dga so where basically the arteries are reversed you can notice that aorta is coming from the right ventricle and pulmonary artery is coming from the left ventricle so what is mandatory here can you tell me so in a tga if the patient wants to survive what is mandatory so you can assume that yes pda is mandatory or most of the patients will be having a large vst so trust me most of the patients will be having a large vst more than pda they will have a large vst and that is mandatory even though it's not mentioned here in this diagram but most of the patients will be having large vst because mixing should happen so if you don't have a vsd or a pda this is incompatible with life so imagine the blood is moving uh, let us assume uh, from right atrium into the aorta right atrium right ventricle into aorta from aorta it's going to enter systemic circulation and from systemic circulation the blood is going to come back via svc and ivc into the right atrium and then into right ventricle and then into aorta and then into systemic circulation and then comes back so it becomes unidirectional circuit it is no longer a bidirectional circuit and look at what's happening here the blood is coming from la to lv from there to pulmonary artery the blood is already oxygenated that blood is again going into the lungs and then coming back into the left atrium via pulmonary veins and then lv this blood is oxygenated again the same oxygenated blood is going to the uh, pulmonary circulation so it's a unidirectional circuit so the left sided blood doesn't go to the other side at all and the right sided blood doesn't go to the other side at all so if you don't have a vsd to mix or if you don't have a pda to mix this blood this is basically incompatible with life so dtga will almost always be associated with either a vsd it will be usually large or patients are going to have a pda so anyone will be there but most of the patients are going to have a large vsd usually and what do you mean by congenitally corrected tga here it's not on the not only the vessels that are reversed here the chambers are reversed so that's what we call as congenitally corrected transposition of great arteries here you can notice that lv and rv has changed their positions lv and rv has changed their positions so basically here also like aorta is originating from the right ventricle and pulmonary artery is originating from the left ventricle like in dtj only same right ventricle aorta left ventricle pulmonary artery which is completely wrong but because the ventricles also have changed their positions now the blood flow is corrected that's all physiologically the blood flow is corrected here the oxygenated blood from la enters rv from there it is going to go into aorta from there into systemic circulation and from there it's going to come back the deoxygenated blood is going to come back into right atrium so it's going to go into the left ventricle and then it's going to go into the pulmonary artery and then into the lungs for oxygenation after oxygenation is going to come back to the left atrium where it's going to enter right ventricle from there into the aorta and so on right so here the blood flow is physiological the blood flow alone is corrected but what danger these patients are having you can notice that here right ventricle is connected to the aorta which means you know the systemic vascular resistance is very very high right systemic vascular resistance is very high so these patients are going to develop early right ventricular failure in fact rv failure is the most important problem here unless until there are any other associated abnormalities but how can rv be on the left side that is the problem here that is the congenital anomaly here 
Mahima is asking how RV can be on the list. That is the congenital abnormality here. So that is why we call it as a congenital heart disease in the first place. So here the main problem is RV failure and patients will develop a very fast RV failure in fact. Very fast in the sense very early. Within like uh, one to two years of life itself, they will start developing severe RV failure. And see, trust me, once RV fails, it's very difficult to treat. So at least LV failure can be treated by a lot of other measures. But RV failure is really, really difficult to treat because RV does not respond to anything much because the muscle mass is small. So ultimately, they'll end up with a transplant only. So that's why this is also a serious condition. This is called as congenitally corrected transposition of great arteries. So now you can understand. So what is DTJ or what is L, uh, congenitally corrected TGA? So DTJ, unless and until you have a large VSD or a PDA, it's incompatible with uh, life. No, 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 no. So it, if it's on the left side, it's not. Mahima is asking if it's on the left side, it must be LV. No, no, no. It's it's not like that. So the morphology is important. So we, we know what is the morphology of left ventricle and what is the morphology of the right ventricle and uh, what's the nature of contraction. Different walls are there. For example, left ventricle has anterior wall, posterior wall, septal wall, inferior wall, but right ventricle has only free wall. So there are so many things that we can make use of it. It's not uh, like, what do you think? If it's left side, it means only left ventricle. The morphology has to be assessed. Okay, so you know, DTJ, unless until you have a large VSD or a PDA, it's incompatible with life. Patients will not survive. But CCTJ, the main problem is going to be right ventricular failure. So what's going to be the treatment? So treatment is going to be arterial switch or it is atrial switch. Anyone can be done. Either arterial switch or atrial switch. Previously, they have been doing something called as atrial switch. Previously, Till 1990s, till 1990s, they have been performing something called as atrial switch that is called a sending procedure or otherwise called as mustard procedure, sending procedure or mustard procedure. So what they tend to do is they just tend to switch the atrium. So the LA to the right side and RA to the left side. Okay, so if they do that, now things would, will correct. So once the atrium is switched, things would have been corrected. But the problem is still in that flow will be corrected, but RV is still attached to iota. So, you know, iota is going to have high systemic vascular resistance. So RV will ultimately fail. So the problem with sending or mustard procedure where they're going to do atrial switch alone is going to correct the hemodynamics. But the problem is this has a high risk of right ventricular failure. So that's the reason currently we don't perform sendings or mustard procedure. Rather, what we have to perform in the modern practice is arterial switch. This is also called as jetting procedure. This is also called as jetin procedure, where we are actually correcting the actual problem. So what is the actual problem here? Aorta to right ventricle, pulmonary artery to left ventricle, right? So we have to switch the arteries. So we have to make the aorta connect to the right, left ventricle and pulmonary artery connect to the right ventricle. So this is not only going to correct the blood flow and hemodynamics, this is also going to correct the structures. So that's why this is the preferred procedure, jetin procedure. Previously, they have been doing sending mustard, that is, atrial switch. So that can correct the blood flow, can correct the hemodynamics, but it's not going to like correct the actual structural problem. So this is associated with high risk of right ventricular failure. So that's why we're not going to perform this in the modern practice. So this is all about TGA and you know one classic x-ray sign that you're going to see in patients with TGA is egg on string appearance, very commonly asked in exams. So that's it. Just know that and move on. That's all. So that's called as egg on string or probably called as egg on side appearance. So typical finding that is seen in a patient with DTG. DTG. All right. So what is the problem in Epstein's anomaly? So Epstein's anomaly is the final thing that I'm going to discuss basically. This is the large cardiac, I mean last cardiac problem that I'm going to, congenital cardiac problem that I'm going to discuss. So what is basically, anyone who's going to answer me? So what is the basic problem in Epstein's anomaly? Yes, it's the atrialization of the right ventricle. If you look at this image, you can understand things better. So you can notice, actually the main problem is in the tricuspid valve. So when you talk about tricuspid valve, you have three leaflets. You have septal leaflet, you have anterior leaflet, and you have posterior leaflet. You have three leaflets for tricuspid valve. When it comes to mitral valve, we know you have AML and PML. But when it comes to your uh, tricuspid valve, you have three leaflets, septal, anterior, and posterior. So what is the main problem here? Here, the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. You can notice that the septal leaflet. So this is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. 
this is displaced it down. So normally the septal leaflet should have been here, right? So that's where the septal leaflet should have been. But this septal leaflet is displaced it down. And there is some echocardiographic criteria also. How much displacement will be called as Epstein's? So technically, if that displacement, the downward displacement of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, if it's more than 8 millimeter per meter square body surface area, if the displacement is more than 8 millimeter per meter square body surface area, this is basically the definition of Epstein's anomaly. In echo, we can actually diagnose, we can quantify it, how much the septal leaflet is displaced down. If it's displaced by more than 8 millimeter per meter square body surface area, compared to that of AML. So how we are going to compare? So this is the anteromitral leaflet. This is the posterior mitral leaflet. We can compare the position of anteromitral leaflet and septal leaflet of the tricuspid should have been at the same position. But you can see the difference now. It is displaced down. So if it's more than 8 millimeter meter square uh, displacement, we can call it as Epstein's anomaly. Are you understanding the definition of Epstein's? So what is the main problem here? That is downward displacement of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve by more than 8 millimeter per meter square body surface area. That is Epstein's. Okay. So you're going to have enlargement of the, yes, yeah, nobody's asking. Those. Okay. So you're going to have enlargement of the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. Okay. You're going to have enlargement of the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve to compensate for this downward movement. Okay, your anterior leaflet. You can notice that this is the anterior leaflet. This is the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And that is very large and sail like that has elongated just to compensate for the downward displacement of the septal leaflet. Your anterior leaflet is kind of very large and often it's called as a sail like anterior leaflet. If you see the word sail like exam, trust me, if you see the word sail like. It often indicates Epstein's anomaly. Sail like, very, very important point. Sail like, large anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. So that is again very characteristic of Epstein's anomaly. Because of these two problems, you can notice that the right atrium is becoming bigger here. The actual size of the right atrium is huge and there are some portion of the right ventricle. So for example, this portion of the right ventricle is actually atrialized. So this is atrialized which means this portion of the right ventricle is actually becoming a part of the right atrium so this portion of the right ventricle is becoming a part of the right atrium so this is what we call as atrialized portion of the right ventricle and you can notice that in these patients the functioning right ventricle is very small it's a very small right ventricle because the right ventricle is very small there is high risk of right ventricular failure there is high risk of right ventricular failure. Over time, they will start developing right ventricular failure. And most of these patients with Epstein's will be having a large ASD also. Most of these patients will be having a large ASD also. Through this ASD, the blood will flow into the left atrium. And this is a kind of a right to left shunt. And that's the reason patients can also develop cyanosis. Remember, whether the patient will have cyanosis or not, whether the patient will have right ventricular failure or not, will be determined by the uh, size of the right ventricle. If the right ventricle is of decent size, then they may have only a very subtle problem. They may not have that much of cyanosis. They may not have that much of right ventricular failure. But smaller the right ventricle is, larger the problems are going to be. You're going to have more and more cyanosis and more and more risk of right ventricular failure. And because the leaflets are quite abnormal, because the leaflets are quite abnormal, there will be TR. Invariably, invariably, every single patient will be having associated tricuspid regurgitation for sure. And this TR is going to dilate the right atrium even more and more and more and more. And they're going to have a huge right atrium. These patients tend to have like very, very large right atrium and RV will be very small. And that is going to result in a classic box-shaped heart in the X-rays. That's called as box-shaped heart. And to be honest, whatever you're seeing in this X-ray is basically the right atrium. And you know, this is the right atrial border and you can see how big the right atrial border is. And to be honest, the entire thing that you're seeing here is the right atrium. So huge right atrium, small right ventricle, downward displacement of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and say like large anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. TR invariable, huge right atrium. Most patients are going to have uh, atrial septal defect and that's it. So this is classic abstinence.
and whether you develop cyanosis and right ventricular failure or not is like completely dependent on the size of the right ventricle. The right ventricle, as I said, is of decent size. Then um, probably like you're going to like not develop cyanosis that frequently and not develop right ventricular failure that easily. But the smaller the right ventricle is, more is going to be the problem. How is going to be the pulmonary blood flow? So it's the condition that's going to be associated with lower pulmonary blood flow. We discussed already, right? So in most of the cyanotic congenital heart is the pulmonary blood flow is going to be low. So where is that? Yeah, yeah. we discussed, no? So low pulmonary blood flow, LV dominant, Epstein's, because RV is very small here. That's why it's LV dominant. In the very first slide we have discussed, the pulmonary blood flow is going to be low. Okay, so no need to discuss about that, right? So trivial tricuspid normal or not? Actually, it's normal. Trivial TR can be seen in old age itself. As you as, as you age, like trivial TR is quite normal. So that's not abnormal. Maybe you would have seen in some echo. That's why you're asking. Okay. Another interesting point about Epstein's anomaly is the fact that most patients will be having WPW syndrome. WPW syndrome. I used to tell this as a kind of a, like stereotypical question exam. Whenever the patient is having severe right atrial enlargement, and if you have WPW syndrome and if the patient is a child, it's equal to Epstein unless proved otherwise. It's basically Epstein unless proved otherwise. If the patient is having right atrial enlargement, huge RE, along with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, it is equal to Epstein's unless proved otherwise. And the important thing about this WPW and Epstein's is the fact that the patient is going to have multiple circuits. Multiple circuits. And it's very difficult to treat. Very difficult to treat. Multiple circuits, very difficult to treat. Not easy. So let me repeat what are the characteristic features? Downward displacement of septal leaflet of tricuspid valve, large sail like anterior leaflet of tricuspid valve, atrialization of right ventricle, huge right atrium, small right ventricle. So RV will be small and it's a LV dominant problem because of that, because RV is very small and patients are going to have TR invariably. There's no doubt because there's a valve abnormality. And TR will worsen the right atrial enlargement and most patients will have an ASD and that's going to mix the blood from RA to LA so that you're going to result in cyanosis often. And patients are at risk of right ventricular failure because the RV is small and on top of that, you're going to have uh, wolf parkinson white syndrome. Very commonly, multiple circuits, difficult to treat and you're going to have a box-shaped heart because of right atrial enlargement. Are you understanding? Clear? About Epstein's and, I mean, of course, the last but not the least, everyone's favorite, that Epstein's lithium during antenatal period. So, uh, I mean, UG students will be, of course, knowing this point, but this is the most trivial point because everyone knows it. And that's not a very important point, though. So, lithium in the antenatal period, if they take up, I mean, if the mother takes up lithium, so it can result in Epstein's anomaly. So, here is an example of an ECG in a patient with Epstein's anomaly. Uh, what you're noticing here in lead two, you can notice one thing that the patient is having a huge P wave. This is a very tall P wave. So we never see tall P wave in lead to like this. That is a sign of what? Right atrial enlargement. You know that, right? And you can notice that this patient's P wave, this patient's P wave is actually like bigger than the QRS itself in V1, which means the right ventricular like firing is very poor. It's actually like the right atrium that is so big here. So that is like typical of Epstein's, a huge. And many times they are also going to call this a Himalayan P waves, very big P waves, very, very big P waves, huge Himalayan P waves. And in a, you can also notice that these patients are having short PR interval and delta waves. You can notice that these patients are having delta waves and short PR interval. So they're now going to have short PR interval along with delta waves. That's a sign of what? Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. That's why I said, Whenever you're going to have like uh, RE with evidence of WPW, so that is Epstein's anomaly unless proved otherwise. So this is actually a kind of a stereotypical case of Epstein's because the easy shows both RE as well as old Parkinson White syndrome. So these are some miscellaneous images. Last slide, just for the sake of knowing, you have to know it. So this is the typical snowman appearance. Whenever you have a snowman appearance, so what does it indicate? So I don't think you have something called Canon P waves. You have Canon A waves, all right? So that's seen in AV dissociation, but and in SVT, but it's not Canon P waves. So whenever you have snowman appearance, figure of eight appearance, it's basically TAPVC, total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. So when you're going to have something called a scimitar sign, so this is a scimitar vein, 
And if you're going to have something like the scimitar sign, that indicates what? It's a type of PAPVC, that is partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. That's a scimitar sign. And uh, this is an example of a gooseneck deformity. Gooseneck deformity. So this is the gooseneck. So there's a gooseneck deformity. When I see gooseneck deformity like this, so it's usually a sign of AV cushion defect. Gooseneck deformity, AV cushion defect. So boot-shaped heart, tetralogy of fallot, and egg on side, egg on string appearance, DDGA. Snowman appearance, figure of eight appearance, TAPVC. Scimitar sign, TAPVC. Gooseneck deformity, AV cushion defect. These are very stereotypical questions. Lithium Epstein's anomaly. So like these are the stereotypical questions, very commonly asked in FMG level exams or probably in uh, basic level need exams, but nevertheless, so I think you have known everything about uh, the important congenital heart disease. It's a huge area. I can keep discussing for hours and hours together, but I hope like you understood like at an undergrad, at, at an undergrad level at least. Okay. Thank you very much. See you in the next session. Maybe the next session will be on clinical cardiology. Maybe we'll try to do in the next Tuesday or probably by next Wednesday. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And bye-bye. Have a good night. Hope you all like the session. Thank you.